Some housekeeping matters before I introduce um, the first panel. If folks here have signed up for CLE credit, you'll need to sign in and out outside um, at the end, at the start and end of every panel in order to get CLE credit because it's being awarded on a panel basis. So just don't forget, otherwise I won't be able to award you CLE credit later. Okay, so without further ado, I'm very excited for the Center to return to in-person programming. Um, this is an annual conference that has been a long time coming. I think we started talking about this topic in 2019 and then early 2020, and then we waited three years <laughs> uh, to be able to finally do this together. Um, so without further ado, um, to my left, we have JC Anderson, who is a restorative justice participant who took a part in the programming in the District of Massachusetts that you will hear more about today. He's currently a reentry coordinator in Massachusetts. To his left, we have the Honorable Leo T. Sorokin, who is a federal district judge in the District of Massachusetts. Um, he previously served as a magistrate judge, as an assistant attorney general in Massachusetts, and as a federal public defender. To his left, we have Clarissa Turner, who is the founder of Legacy Lives On, which is a nonprofit that provides ongoing support to families who have lost loved ones to violence. She also has participated in the District of Massachusetts restorative justice programming as a proxy victim. And to her left, we have Maria Dadieko, who is a United States probation officer in the District of Massachusetts and who facilitates and helped found the restorative justice programming that you're going to hear more about. So with that, I'll leave it to you guys. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Do I need to? OK. Um, so um, I'm going to give you a little overview of what our program is and, why I, and how I came to think about restorative justice, and then turn it over to Marie, first Maria and to explain a little more detail about what we do, and then to Clarissa and JC, who can really um, give you a sense of what restorative justice means to us in the District of Massachusetts and really what our program is uh, about. Um, so for me, where I started on this, and we've, been, we've had a restorative justice program in the federal court in Massachusetts now for um, about eight years. Um, uh, it, it came from a couple big picture considerations, and they're these. One, that crime harms people, that many people um, who have committed a crime don't, they might know in their head that crime harms people, but the process that we have doesn't really facilitate them appreciating that crime harm people in their heart, and it doesn't really give them a lot of opportunity to express that um, or address it. Um, another is that um, people who've been harmed by crime um, often have many needs and um, concerns that are not really heard or addressed in the traditional approach that we have to criminal cases. Um, uh, another is that our system doesn't really promote repair. Uh, a significant thing I think of when you do something that causes harm is that you should try to fix it. And you can't necessarily fix everything. You can't turn the clock back, but um, we don't really, we have restitution and we have certain orders like that, but they don't really often address the harm. The reality is most of the time when there's a restitution order, the person who's supposed to pay restitution it's just an impossibility that they'll ever be able to pay anything meaningful, if anything at all, and as a practical matter. And so um, we don't, those are important unaddressed considerations, and we're, we punish people for sure, but oftentimes, uh, in my experience, prison isn't really about accountability, it's about punishment or um, isolation. And so um, uh, I've, been interested in restorative justice because I think it gives an opportunity to address all of these things in a much more meaningful way than our present system does. And I think these are all uh, important values in our country, in our culture, and in our legal system. So that's where, why I'm here, and why, at least for me, I've been interested in this for a long time. Um, it fits into the traditional criminal justice system that we have um, in the following ways in Massachusetts. First, we have in Massachusetts a program called RISE. RISE is essentially akin to a program that exists in a lot of federal courts, not all, but many, where a defendant, a certain categories of defendants, in our case for RISE, it's defendants on release who have one of two further attributes. They're either 
have a serious drug problem in short form, or they have serious deficiencies in family, employment, education, um, social connections, or um, social pro-social judgments. And those people who roughly fit that can plead, get into the program, means they plead guilty early and they delay their sentencing for a year. They do a variety of treatment programs, could be parenting, could be drug treatment, could be a variety of things like that. The, what's unusual and distinctive about RISE is that everybody does our restorative justice program. So one group of people who are doing restorative justice in Massachusetts is all the participants in RISE. So those of you in the Southern District or Eastern District, I know the Eastern District has POP, I think, and they have a, another program, I forget the name, and I think the Southern District has a similar program, uh, or maybe it's not similar, but it's a, its own program that's unique to the Southern District, I'm sure. But it has a program. And um, so RISE is something like that. And everyone, that's one group of people who do restorative justice. And whether from the restorative justice or RISE, you get no, what we promise people is the promise that every federal judge makes in every case, in every criminal case in the United States of America, which is the promise that we will consider all relevant facts at sentencing. And so we consider that you did restorative justice and what we're really interested in and what I tell my colleagues that really matters is not that you sat in the circle, but what happens afterwards? What are your words and deeds afterwards? What's your response? How is it, have you changed and what about it? So, and that's totally, in fact, it'd be unlawful, I think, not to consider those words and deeds. And the challenge, of course, is what weight to give it, but that's a different question. And so that's one place it fits into the system. A second place it fits into the system we do it is we have what, what Marie and I call one-off cases. Those are cases where an individual a judge or a prosecutor or a defense attorney says this person, uh, or could become from the defendant himself, wants to do restorative justice, I think they'd be a good candidate, even though they're not in RISE, or they don't qualify for RISE or whatever. And we have individuals like that over the last eight years who've participated. Some of those people are awaiting sentencing. Some of them are awaiting, probably haven't yet pled. Some of them are on, some of them have been in detention. Some of them have been on supervised release, post-prison, um, a variety. So that's a second group where it fits in, and those are, it, it works just fine for those people. A third, big cohort of people more recently is about a year and a half or two years ago, the, our court approved a pilot program of offering our restorative justice program to people who are detained in federal cases. So these are people who are arrested, charged in the federal court in Boston and not released but ordered held without uh, any release in custody pending their trial or sentencing. So we did that at one, we're almost done with that pilot. We've done three cohorts through our restorative justice program there. And I would say, although we haven't had a formal report back to the court yet, it's been tremendous success. We have tremendous interest. People, a really positive response to people in the, in the jail were really interested. The prison administrators had no problem with it. It worked pretty smoothly. And so um, that's an, another place it fits in. So um, the challenge, some of which we're going to talk about in the third panel, really in all this, is how do we expand? And how do we offer more of this and give people more opportunities? Because the general, my view of it is it's generally been quite positive and helpful. And these are all opportunities we're creating for people to do with what they do with it. And so what you think you'll find is not only are the people who are people charged with crimes or been convicted of crimes who are finding it a very positive experience. But the people who've been harmed, people who are victims, and I should say many of the people who are persons who've been harmed by crime who participate in our program were not harmed by, the, by a particular defendant in a particular federal case necessarily. So they might sit in a circle with um, other people who committed crimes, not, not in any way directly harmed them but committed crimes that might in some way be similar to the experiences or caused, similar to the crimes that caused them harm. And what we, we use the term surrogate victim in those instances. And we found that works just fine. And I, we found, and you'll hear from Clarissa um, and my experience both with Clarissa and with others, is that the people find it very helpful. They like it. They want their, Clarissa I think would say she wants us to do more of it. And so, um, uh, and I will tell you that and some people I talk to, they find it healing and empowering. And that is, like alone, is enough reason to do it without anything else. 
So it fits into the system in a variety of different ways like that. And I will tell you that there are other places that like, without going beyond, it, it makes me think of three other things. One is I've started talking, giving opportunities for people, victims of crimes, in those cases in federal court when we have victims, to have a conference between the plea, the conviction and the sentencing to answer questions. And I tell the prosecutors it's optional. If the people don't want to come, no problem. But if they want to come, that's fine. They can come by phone, Zoom, in person, and I'll answer any questions that they ask. Or I will tell, if it's a question I can't answer, I'll tell them I can't answer it and explain why. And not everybody comes, but those who come and you've uniformly expressed to me how much they appreciated that the judge took the time to listen to them, to hear them, and answer their questions. So that to me is a restorative justice change, and it's an easy thing to do, and it's been very positive. Um, it makes you, when you ask the questions, who's been harmed, have they been harmed, and who's responsible for repair, it makes you think differently about a lot of things, and uh, I won't go into detail, but it makes you think, for example, as Rachel, uh, Professor Barkon knows, I testified before the Sentencing Commission, I proposed that they change the cooperation guideline to allow a prosecutor to authorize a lower, ask for a lower sentence under the guidelines for a defendant who identified and helped get into treatment and sobriety drug addict or one or more drug addicts. And I was thinking about the retail drug dealer who can't cooperate, but who could help like repair the harm he caused by helping some of those people get into treatment it would make a difference in the community. It would make a difference that would be a positive change if that person wanted to participate in that. And it could save somebody's life. Um, unfortunately, Professor Barco was, did not have all the votes on the commission. And so um, if it were one commissioner, I'm confident it would have passed. But there were other commissioners, so it didn't go anywhere. But that's, that came to me as a restorative justice innovation. Once you start thinking this way, you think about a lot of things differently and in a positive way. So um, I'm going to, uh, uh, I think I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to answer questions later, but I'll turn it over to Maria, who really is the heart and soul of what, the reason we have a restorative justice program is not because of me, it's because of Maria. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, we do need you sometimes, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Maria Dadieko. Um, I am a federal probation officer. Thanks for having me here, and thanks for being here on this gorgeous spring day, being inside instead of out there. Um, so I'm going to just briefly tell you a little bit about the program that we have, and then I'm going to turn it over to Clarissa and JC, who really, those are the folks that are the heart and soul of our program. Um, so what I'll start off by saying is that I've been a federal probation officer in the District of Massachusetts for 14 years now. And before that, I worked at the Department of Children and Families, which is the child welfare system in Massachusetts. And I can say without a doubt that this is the most meaningful work I have ever done. The work in restorative justice is transformational for myself, for the clients that we work with, and for the community members that we engage in a way that feels the closest to justice, despite me being in the federal court system that um, I've experienced. And so I know folks here are familiar with restorative justice, but very briefly, if you were to Google restorative justice, lots of different definitions are gonna pop up. But for us, we think of restorative justice as a victim-centered, values-driven theory of justice, where we start shifting the idea of committing a crime to thinking about crime as harm, that a harm has been caused, and that the best way to deal with that harm once it's caused is not, no offense, with lots of attorneys or judges and probation officers, but it's really with those closest to the harm that have been impacted. That is who? That is the victim or the victims, the responsible party, the person responsible for the harm, and their community. And that when we bring those stakeholders together, and engage them in restorative processes, which we'll talk a little bit more about, that that will cause and result in um, a, a transformational process and getting closer to justice. And so 
The way that we do that in the District of Massachusetts um, is when we started thinking about this, we had sort of a resource problem. So traditionally, restorative justice practices are done on an individual basis. There's one defendant, one crime, and perhaps a practitioner would work with that defendant and a victim through the process. And so um, we created a program to try to touch more defendants as possible. And then our other issue was that the majority of cases, although now we've grown and see a variety of different cases, but when we started, the, the majority of cases that we saw were really gun and drug cases. And by statute in federal court, those cases are victimless. But we all know that gun and drug trafficking aren't victimless. There are people impacted by that. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our program. Um, I wanna pause for a second and say that our program is very much um, steeped in the circle process, which is a Native American um, process that uh, I learned back when I was in the um, Department of Children and Families. And so all, all of our program really is based in indigenous teachings and values. So our program has four parts. Um, uh, the first part is an introductory session where a defendant either applies through RISE or through another um, mechanism to participate in the restorative justice program. And so a restorative justice coordinator like myself or Jamie will meet with a client and we'll basically do like a crash course on restorative justice in RJ 101, um, where we're starting to introduce the idea of shifting your thought process from committing a crime or breaking the law or what are the elements to really thinking about what was the harm that was caused in this situation. We start introducing topics of really acceptance of responsibility. And what does that mean? Not necessarily pleading guilty or sort of agreeing to what the government says you did wrong, but really in one's heart of hearts, what is it that went wrong? And what was the harm that was caused? Um, and then also shifting this idea of victimless crime. Thinking about the ripple effect of one's behavior and the impact that that has on self family, friends, community. We're also starting to build relationship with clients in a very different way. So this is not an adversarial exchange at all. And this is really where the restorative work begins because many clients have been through the system in, in a variety of different ways and haven't had good experiences. And so a lot of people will listen and they're respectful and they say, oh, this all sounds nice, but my case doesn't count because my case didn't have a victim. And rather than saying, how could you say that? You know, we invite them to participate, to keep an open mind and hang on with us through the process. The second part is really a big meat and potatoes part of the program. Um, it's a 16 hour restorative circle where we bring together defendants, victims, community members, and we sprinkle in a few law, uh, criminal justice practitioners, not too many because they take over the circle, um, and we go through an intensive experiential process where we're starting to dig deep and unpack these concepts in a different way. We're doing individual work, we're doing small group work, we're doing large group work, we're um, really getting to know each other. And again, this traditional circle is based in the tr uh, teachings um, of the indigenous culture that we learned it from. And so in this space is a very different experience where folks are invited to also think of the harm that's been caused to them. And so we create some space for folks to think of the harm that, that's been done to them, which really is one of the first times that a criminal justice person is inviting them to think this way or acknowledging that harm has been done. And what we find is that when we sort of invite folks to think that way, it creates more space for them to think of harm that they have caused as well. And for many folks, that experience in and of itself is very powerful. At the end of it, we have people saying things like, 
I've never thought of this this way. This was a totally aha moment. And if I could record how many times people say that, we don't pay them to say it, um, but it's many, many, many. Um, and that's it. So we tell folks that once you complete parts one and two of the program, we will report back to the court that you finished. You completed the program. You don't have to do anything else. As Judge Sorokin said, you're not getting anything sort of to do the program. You're not going to get anything extra special to continue on to the other parts. But we have two additional parts that are voluntary. And if anyone knows anything about probation, no client is knocking on probation's door to volunteer to do anything. In fact, the things that, that we have to ask them to do because a judge ordered them to do are sometimes hard to get folks to do. But um, we're, one of the greatest statistics, I think, is that more than 80% of clients that go through the first two parts, so parts one and two, volunteer to continue and do more. And so they're not getting anything extra, there's no sort of reward, but just those experiences were so different and hopefully transformational that it, it, it sort of inspires folks to continue. The third and fourth phases. So the third phase um, we've been doing sort of, and, and Jamie takes the lead on this, uh, six week reading group. It's trauma-based. He'll talk a little bit more about it in the other panels, I think. But it's an opportunity for folks to, in a small group setting, also circle-based, to start to unpack other concepts of trauma, um, their own ideas of acceptance of responsibility and accountability. Um, and if folks are not available to do the six-week reading group, we tailor a program for each individual person. We've given folks some individual readings and they can do some reflections or we've assigned them some um, videos and they've done voice recordings. And it's all preparing them for the last part, which is an individual restorative conference. And a coordinator will work with every client who is interested in volunteers to coordinate an individual restorative process with them. And that's a client meeting with a victim, someone that they've harmed, or people that they've identified that they've harmed. And in our, in our program, we also match them with what we call surrogate victims, folks that have experienced a similar harm but aren't specifically connected. So I'll give you an example. So we had a client who sort of middled a gun deal, right? So he um, knew someone who had a bunch of guns and he connected that person with someone else who wanted a bunch of guns. And so when we first met this person, um, you know, he was really mad that he was caught up in federal court. He's like, all I did was the connect. Like, I didn't even know where the guns were coming from. I didn't know where they were going. I didn't want to. Um, and that all was true. But he's still in federal court. And so going through the program, at the end, we were able to connect him with um, a mother who lost a child to gun violence. And so while their two stories were not connected at all, we were able to engage in a restorative dialogue where that defendant understood, I get it. Like I might not have been the person who shot your son, but I could have been a cog in the wheel that created that, that process. And so over and over again, we hear not just from the clients, but also from the community members that participate um, that this really gives folks a voice that is missing in the traditional system. It gives them an opportunity to um, think about their own acceptance of responsibility and their own role in community in a very different way. It humanizes all of us, including the criminal justice professionals that are traditionally very siloed, right? We're in these very adversarial roles a lot of times when really we're all hopefully working towards the same thing, to keep our community safer and to help folks. And so the hope of our program is that, you know, one year, three years, five years down the road when, you know, the jail time is over and the supervision of probation is over, that folks are going to be met with a difficult decision in their life again, and they're going to have a choice to make. And the hope is that they call on this very unique experience that they had, this restorative process with people from their community, these promises that they've made, um, and they make a different decision. So I'm going to stop there because I want to make sure that um, 
Clarissa and JC have some time to speak. But I'm going to turn it over to Clarissa, who is one of the community members that um, graciously works with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am a mother of six beautiful blessings. Um, my oldest son, life was taken. Um, restorative justice has been a pillow for me. It's kind of emotional because I got to meet with one of the men that killed my son just last week. And if it wasn't for restorative justice, that would have never happened. As I always say, homicide, harm in the world does not come with directions nor instructions. So what do you do when it hits you? Which way do you turn, right? This was my son, my first, my oldest. I was introduced to restorative justice a few months before my son's trial was getting ready to begin. And I will say, so the saying, hurting people hurt people is true. But I'm a living, I'm a, um, a living testimony that heal people heal people. I remember um, me and my daughter, Chardonnay, who was asked to do impact statements at my son's trial. And from the harm that was opposed upon me, I was so angry. Now, I am not a bitter, angry person. I'm born and raised from a Christian family background. My grandmother was a pastor. My mother was an evangelist. So you know what those households look like. We had um, God for our breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> Every day, we was either Bible study or choir rehearsal or something. So I know, and I know God. I know my faith. I know what I am supposed to do, my belief. So when I lost my son, I posed the questions to God, why me, God? Why me? I go to church. I pay my tithes. My grandmother was a pastor. Then that count for anything. Like, why was I chosen for this pain? If you lost a loved one, not to death or illness, but to murder. We watch these murder shows on TV, and we see these actors' lives be taken, but we see them again in another movie. But this is a reality for me. And I remember someone came to me and said, um, why not you? And of course, I was in my state of being upset and being frustrated and hurt too. Why was this allowed to happen? Because the individuals that killed my son had been arrested multiple other times for other murders. And my question was, why was they free to kill mine? There's a saying in the word of God that says, many are called and few are chosen. And now today, honestly, I can now embrace the fact that I am one of those chosen ones, able to turn my pain around for such a beautiful purpose, to bear witness to being invited into spaces as of this and rise, to be able to sit and be a surrogate for individuals who are harming, but to them, it's just an act of doing for their survival, but like what Maria was just speaking on. I remember, I don't know if I was the person who was talking about, but I do remember there was a situation when there was a man on the phone and he was speaking about um, all he did was but he didn't feel like that was nothing major. But after we was talking, and to have this man break down and cry and apologize, when harm is brought upon you, what do you want? For someone to say, I'm sorry, right? You want somebody to acknowledge you in your pain. And him not realizing he was giving me another elevation to my healing process because here's someone who is now taking ownership of something that he's doing or he's been doing to survive, but now he's realizing and hearing somebody else's pain, and now he wants to change his life around. And he's asking for forgiveness, I'm sorry for. I remember him saying, I didn't kill your son, but the role I played, it could have been one of those guns. So that's the reality of what's happening. He was able to take himself, take his mental out of, out of check of just trying to survive, but now on a real life reality of one of those guns could have killed and could have killed many others. His life was changed from rise. He had an opportunity now to be held accountable and he was holding himself accountable. And to my understanding, the last time a check-in, he had made change and so many others. And it's, it's not always about guns. You know, we talk about addiction. You know, we been in there and individuals who've been struggling for years and years and they have children at home 
and just being in spaces with surrogates because we all have a story. It's not just homicide. It's other things as well. But being able to be heard and be able to utilize your voice and your pain and talk about your reality, your struggles, and your struggle is somebody else's struggle and somebody else's struggle. So when you're talking about something you're going through, you're resonating to somebody else, and then they're looking at you like, if you can do it, I can do it as well. I thank God for the opportunity also of him giving me the strength to the murder of my son birthed something so beautiful. So when they say something ugly can be turned around for beauty, it's true. Because when I heard it, I was like, that's impossible. There is no good going to come out of my son being murdered. Never in a day, but um, God showed me different. Legacy Live On is a blessing, not just to myself, to my family, to community, and it has elevated from it just starting off being a support for individuals who was hurt and harmed, but now I'm being invited into spaces of working inside of correctional centers and DYSs and community and um, rallying up stuff. So what we do is we circle around. We don't run from, we run to. Harm came knocking at my door. So for me, it's to run to, I'm not running from because it's not just all about me and my family, it's about everybody in this room. And this is what we don't realize, it takes something to have to happen before we move and do something and shift. Because before I lost my son, I knew nothing about restorative justice. I would see individuals lose their loved ones to homicide, but it didn't impact me. I would say, Lord, give that family strength. I pray for them, but it wasn't the same as now that it has impacted me, because now I know what I have to do. I have to do what I do, what you serve. RISE has been a blessing, and I can say that over and over again because it has built so many uh, relationships. So before losing my son, I never had a close relationship with a district attorney, <laughs> a probation officer, a judge, you know. So now I'm up here like, yo, see my surroundings, see where I'm at, right? <laughs> but um, also I know my son is looking down on me like, mom, you got this. And even meeting my um, son's um, killers, one of them, like I went through a process of when I asked to meet him because I felt like I didn't want the individuals to come out and commit this harm again and impose it on someone else. My son's, his death is not in vain. And for it not to be in vain, there were some things I had to do, which was face one of them. In the process now, facing the other individual who pulled the um, trigger on my son. But when the young man was in another prison, they didn't have restorative justice in there. So there he heard a lot of, why are you doing this? Because when I asked, he did say he would do it. He didn't know what he was getting himself into. So he was, you know, checking in with some of the other inmates, asking questions, should I do it? A lot of them said, no, you shouldn't. Norfolk prison in Boston is an RJ prison. So God has set it up for you. If you have faith and you trust and believe. Um, they transported him to Norfolk. I'm gonna give you timelines, but then maybe I'll say two weeks. We had a meeting scheduled. Now, when he went to Norfolk, as soon as he walked through those doors, he was circled up with restorative justice from the inmates that were there. And that was God's amazing grace because then I was getting worried that now he's ready and he's ready to sit with you. Now he can do this work. He wrote me a letter. He said, before I meet with her, I need to write her a letter. And I bought the letter with me because the letter is so impactful. And that's what restorative justice would do. I wanted this man to apologize, but I wanted it to be real. I didn't want him to just say I'm sorry to appease me. I wanted him to say sorry and mean it. And I wanted to know that the RJ was, was, was being impactful for him. So when he does come home, he would come home different and new. And I even told my son, my other son, I said, um, I can see him coming home and me and him working together in community. And that's what I see in my vision. I believe it's going to come to pass. And he said, Ma, how can you? And I said, how can I? I said, because there's other people out here in this community that we need to be an example for and show. I have a model that I follow. Live, love, and value life. And so often we take people, places, and things for granted. We see them, we have expectations, they're gonna be here forever, but let me tell you, my forever ended on November 29th, 2011. You know, Maria, sometimes we, like we're talking, you know, she'll say things like, like, yes, judge, I do want this to go on, and on and on and on. This needs to go on because we all 
we come to these meetings, these tables, our notepad and our pens, and we writing down, you know, the thoughts and the plans for what's gonna happen. But who's executing, who's putting this in position in place? A lot of us are stuck on fear and what if the what not. But you can't fear something if you haven't opposed to put it together in front line. The pain that people go through in this world, because you have not been there or you're not going through it, don't dismiss it. We all in this room have power. We have strength and direction to build and create something beautiful, to bring safety to our community, to bring safety to our homes, our backyards, our front doors. And I think a lot of times we think we can't. I'm a person, I don't thrive on what I can't do, I'm gonna thrive on what I can do. I'm not one to talk about it, but I'll be about it. I'll meet you there. I would like, if possible, if someone can read the letter that this young man wrote. And this young man now is practicing restorative justice. This man now has apologized, like in a meeting, it was awkward. How do you sit across the table from someone who harmed you in such a way knowing that they are coming home and now can live their lives. And he just turned 32. And my son is in the ground, right? By the grace of God. And sitting there and hearing this man talk about restorative justice, talking about his plans and what it can look like and what he wanna do. So, so we talk about phases, right? So we have phases of, we have the youth that are in community hurting and hurting and hurting. We have adults that are in the community hurting, hurting and hurting, but who was out here trying to help support and prepare this hurt? And that's what I see RISE do. I see RISE as we sitting in these conferences and we coming together and we're talking, you got people in pain. You can see their way, they wear their pain and now they have an outlet and they feel supported to be able to, oftentimes Jamie will say, well, this is my role and if y'all want me to leave, I'll leave because I don't want you to feel uncomfortable and they want him to stay. How often do you want a DA to stay and hear what you're doing, right? You want to hide your, hide your job, it's not put on the forefront. So you have a judge in the space, you have an attorney in the space, you have a probation officer, but these people are humans. So you take away the title and you see them as Maria, Jamie, Judge Sirocco, right? <laughs> Stop, Leo. <laughs> They see them as people, not as the titles. And then they feel like, wow, they really care. Because that's what people want to know. Someone genuinely do care about them and what happens. And that's what they demonstrate. And then a follow up after. And then allowing us to come in as surrogates. And you know, sometimes I can get in there and I can keep my straight face and swallow my pain and just get through. And other times I'm a mess. Like our eyes and snots running because to, like, I have to rehearse and repeat this story, but I, it gives me honor and joy to do it because I know my story is impacting somebody else to want to be better and do better. So I can go on and on, and I know I'm jumping around because I'm trying to get so much out at one time, but I can go on and on and on and on and on. This can take all day, probably a week, because there's so much inside of me from the day I birthed my son and to the day I buried my son and to even now today. So I'm trying to just hit on the rise. I keep on getting sidetracked on Legacy Lives On because this is how it all began. My son's murder have created something beautiful. I miss him. I want him back. And that's what kind of what he said. He said to me and he said in a letter like, He comes from a home, living in the projects, a single parent home, and they was out here just creating so much harm and hurt, and he didn't care. They didn't care. It was a game. But he was like, um, he's sorry for killing my son, but he's like, killing your son saved my life. But I understand, I get it. I get it. Because it stopped him. And now he's being made to be held accountable. We know when you get locked up, he talked about when you get locked up, and I hear this when I go into prison, how individuals suppress what they do and just do the time. And that's why it's so easy for individuals to come back out and harm 
and hurt again and again and again because they've never really been made to face what they've done and who they hurt and harmed. And I remember saying, so I think I'm gonna come back. He was like, nah. I was like, why not? He said, because when I see you, it hurts. And I said, when I see you, it hurts. But this is something that I will do so you can come out and be better and do better. He even asked me if I would meet his mother. You know what I'm saying? So now here's a relationship with someone who harmed me and my family that I don't know what the future's gonna hold. But I'm open to it because it's creating a new for him, for me, for the community, right? So he's an elder, right? So now, you know, they talk about the, the, the OG's the elder of the gang. He's an older man now. So we kind of talked about what that looked like when he get home. He already got his little soldiers ready for him to come home. We talked about what that's going to look like. You know what I'm saying? So you're going to come out. As I'm planting the seed in you for the good, I need you to do this for them. They're waiting for you to come out to continue the ruggers. This needs to end. So if it wasn't for restorative justice, I wouldn't have never had this platform to be able to sit with this young man and birth a new within him. That's what I'm saying. RJ is, is so many pieces to this puzzle, but when you put it together, it's such a beautiful picture. My daughter, before I met him the day before, she was like, Mom, like how? She said, I couldn't be you. And I'm sitting there like, okay, shot it. She said, I couldn't be you, Mom. How, how, how you doing this? And you know how I'm doing it? Because I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I forgave this gentleman. I have to practice what I preach. I have, to, I have to be an example, set an example for him, for community. So let me stop talking. But is it possible that someone can read the letter sometime before this is over? Because I want you all to hear this young man. And, and, and when he's talking, he's talking about the process. He don't even realize it. I kind of hipped him to him while I was talking to him. I said, this is called the process. He was like, the process, I told you, this is just the beginning phase of the process. So when you hear, you're gonna hear the transition in him and the process, you know? So I'm going to stop talking now, and I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, I'm J.C. Anderson. Um, thank you for sharing that. That was one of the stories that helped me. Um, I'm gonna rewind it back when I was growing up. I grew up, I was born in Boston to a kind of tough neighborhood, but my mother moved to Brockton to another tough neighborhood. Um, my father was always there in my life, but they had separated. Um, I was a two sport person, played basketball, football for Brockton High in the glory years. Um, but my friend was murdered when we was in high, I was in high school, he was out of high school. My best friend, he got killed. Um, I didn't know how to adjust to it. I didn't know who to talk to about it. Back then, if you talked to somebody, he was weak. So we just went on about dealing with things in our own way. So starts where I get caught with a handgun at an early age some reason I couldn't understand, but I, the feds, the government picked the case up. So now I'm like, you know, um, what am I gonna do? I sit there, some older guys, influence, take the time. I took the time, I did the time. Um, it was about four and a half years I did. I didn't learn nothing about a gun. Didn't hear nothing while I was in there about a gun. Um, all I wanted to do was lift weights and continue to play sports. So I was released. Um, I was on probation, did the probation time, got off. Um, I had a girlfriend while I was in there that kind of, you know, we, we, I had a kid by her. I'm sorry, I had a kid by her, actually two kids. And when I came home, we had separated you know, being young and doing time, you can't ask everybody to do time with you because, um, you know, life changes daily. So as I cut out, you know, moving on, I meet now that I wish she was here, but it's my wife. Her name is Kiona, good person. Um, 
next thing you know, we, uh, I start, I get off probation and I start, you know, she sees me just hanging around. I start going out. Um, I'm getting back to the people that, you know, are not good for me. So next thing you know, um, I'm back in the life. I get arrested. And as I get arrested, it's a federal charge. I blamed everybody but me when I got arrested for the second time. It wasn't my fault. Um, somebody did this to me. It was somebody's um, hate me or they hating on me or this, that, and the further. Um, I, for some God reason, I get this defender, public defender that takes over my case. Very strong, very no nonsense. Um, makes you look at yourself in a sense that she showed me she cared. So, you know, I get a nice time, but I go do my time again. Um, it's something I could deal with, and I would still be young at, when I come home. It was uh, um, 10 years. So I did the 10 years. Now I did five, almost five years for a gun. Now I'm doing 10 years. Um, I'm doing 10 years, and it's a lot of, you know, the same thing that's going on. Um, maybe some people can go for a day and change their life. At that time, it wasn't me, to be honest with you, and being honest with yourself. Um, I just looked for the day I went in and the day I got out. Um, when I got out, my kids was kind of grown. I had lost um, my first son's mother to addiction, overdose. Um, I had got stuck in jail. I did a drug program, but I couldn't get the time off, and that made me bitter because I had got hurt while I was in there playing sports. But all in all, while I'm doing this 120 months, um, anger management, parenting, I did all the classes, but nothing challenging my mind or anything that I was going through. It was just, let me sit in this class with 20 other people and get the certificate, because maybe I'll go home early. Um, so after the 120 months, I come out. Um, I'm out. My son's grown now. Um, he's actively in the streets at this time, and next thing you know, I'm back out there. Self-explanatory. I'm, I'm back. Um, I'm doing this, but I get arrested again. Here I go. I'm sitting in there. It's this big thing. We're on the news. I'm, I'm, I'm still. I'm sitting there. You'll probably hear from a guy that knows me best. When things was wrong, I was like, you know, I did this once, I did this twice, but it can't be everybody's fault this time. It's something that I'm doing. It, it, it got to be. It's, what's, what's going on? Like, these are people I, I be with every day. Why would they do this to me? So as I'm in there, um, I have another lawyer, and for some reason, somehow, um, my wife, Kiona, gets in touch with the lawyer, and she comes up to see me. She's not happy. If she could, I know she would have probably hit me. If she could, through the gate, because what are you doing here? I thought we dealt with this. This wasn't you. You're going to change your life. So um, she worked hard. She got me um, free to a bracelet but she wanted me in this program, and I was like, uh, I don't know what, what, what's the program about. She was like, you know, do it. I'm gonna see if it can happen. I got into the program. Um, wow. When I got into the program, like Maria said, we was all in a circle, and I can remember my first thoughts is, I'm not talking, I'm not saying I'm a prosecutor, probation officer. I don't know who they're going to tell. I, shh, yeah, I'm just going to sit back and hear their stories, do the less. But after the first 10, 15 minutes, I was in my chair sitting up listening, ears open, eyes open. 
And I know we have a confidentiality thing in the circle, but it was somebody in a total different life, total different work field that had me, my eyes watering because we was looked at as people. We wasn't looked at what was on paper and I'm pretty sure if some of you guys came around me when you see me out there, you'll be like, this guy got a tough look. Um, he could be trouble. They wasn't willing to do that anymore. They was willing to get to know you. And as I go back to that circle, it made me reach back that I was a victim. I was somebody suffering. I was someone hurting, but was willing to hurt people due to my actions. And when I left that program after them sessions, I was ready to pass this on to the community. I was willing to do whatever I can to help the next person or even talk to them about my experience because it was so powerful to know that they wasn't gonna look at me as a, what was on that paper. They was gonna get to know me before anything happens. And I, I thank them to this day. Um, I couldn't financially go out there and just help people out of a situation, but I, got, I jumped to an opportunity to deal with addiction. Um, my case was dealing drugs. So when I got into this addiction, I seen what was going on now. And it made me give my all to these people. And when I left out of there each day, I felt good about myself because I was helping in some way. I was dealing with them in some way and it was all because of restorative justice. And you know, it comes to the point now, you know, I'm out, I'm free and I'm going for breakfast by myself before I go to work. Now from my past life to now, you know, I, who would have thought I would have ran to a prosecutor and snuck up on him and said, hey, how you doing <laughs> at breakfast? And he turned around and we just braced and you know, he asked me what I was doing and it's, it's, that's the type of feeling that I love now. Um, and it's just been so helpful that that restorative justice got me to think deeply into myself. And when I can heal myself, I'm able to be a better person to my family, be a better husband to my wife, be a better friend to people, or be a better recovery specialist to the addicted family. Or now that I just got hired a month ago, dealing with probation out of Brockton and Superior Court as a reentry coordinator. So I thank Restorative Justice for digging in deep. I hope it, you know, some of you might be prosecutors or judges or probation officers. I just giving you the look that know the person, not on the paper, but get to know that person. Because like we say, no matter how many times a person comes through there that's addicted, don't turn them away. Because it might be that time that they get that chance to either you kick them out or you don't accept them and they die. Or it's that chance that they say, I get it. Something clicks. And I think Restore the Justice for putting that click into me to get me to say, I want this. I want to do it. Um, I was never offered anything for it. Um, dealing with the justice and standing before the judge. And I understood that from the beginning to even when they get called to help. It's something that I feel I can work because it worked. And I'm only telling you a little bit, but there's you know, there's, a, there's a, a lot that changed in me that I thank them for all the ones that participated and seen it in me to giving me that chance because it really helped. And I'm able to help others because of it. Um, so I thank y'all. I thank those that was involved. 
I think that tough lawyer that was so eager to, you know, stay with me, didn't want to. She was really mad at me, but she stayed. And it was to that point that I could tell others that was in that predicament to me that you're blessed to be around that person. You're blessed to have that person because she's going to look at you and give you 100% honesty, which gave me the chance to be honest with myself. But you got to know what you want to do. And thank God I knew what I wanted to do. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Environment, uh, the prison environment can be a very negative one. Is there any way that you could think of, um, or are you considering within your program some way to reinforce um, the lessons even while the person is in prison, or to have a program when they get out of prison to follow up? Well, I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, we have thought about that. I think we're, uh, the resource issue is a serious one. Um, and the program has become very sought after. So I think that um, we're focused on sort of serving the folks that, are, that, that, that we have now. However, I will share a very quick story because your question um, makes me think of it. And we had an individual, a client, go through our restorative justice program. And he came back and sat in as a uh, peer leader. So folks like JC and others that have gone through our program um, generously come back and volunteer to go through the program again as peer leaders for others. And this individual, very similar to JC and others, really like knocked it out of the park, like totally changed his entire life, did everything possible. And um, he went to sentencing and we were all really, really, really hoping that this particular judge would see all of this amazing work that this person did and not send him back to jail. Um, but he did. He ended up with a short jail sentence, but nonetheless a jail sentence, which, which disrupts lots of things. It disrupted his housing, his employment, etc. And frankly, I was really concerned that this really great superstar or someone that um, I felt like had really made this change was gonna do just that, go back into this terrible environment and sort of take steps back. And he taught me that in fact, the work that he did and the change that he made in the program, and Jamie can attest to this as well, it carried him through that time. And he did the time, impacted folks on the inside, and came out and literally picked up right where he left off with, without skipping a beat. And so, yes, it, it, certainly when folks go back into prison or into that setting, um, especially for long periods of time. But I think that the, the point is that this experience can be so meaningful and transformational that despite your surroundings, it can create shifts in the way that you show up in the world. I think also, just to, so um, I had a case um, that wasn't my case that she's describing, but that person, just to bookend it, um, the taxpayers paid for that person to spend the night at a hotel after his sentencing before he went to prison so he could speak to a convention of federal judges. A week or two later, I think it was, maybe a month, but something more like a week or two, he self-surrendered to the federal prison. I think his sentence was four, he had four or five? It was like 18 months total, but he'd already served. He'd already served a bunch of times, so he had to do a bunch more months. He did the bunch more months, he came out. A week after he was released from federal prison, I was with him again at a panel for a different convention of federal judges, again. So he stayed then at another hotel out in California where we were, and he spoke to that group, and he spoke beautifully uh, to both groups and talked about the experience. So, but, I, but it was a short amount, of, relatively short amount of time. To your point where you're thinking about it, someone who says, so I think of a case I had where 
I, mean, I don't know what the answer will be, but someone who um, I imposed 10 years on, it was a mandatory minimum sentence, and before his sentencing, um, he, uh, he, actually at his sentencing, what was supposed to be his sentencing, there was a letter from a professor, uh, a, a three, three or four page single space type letter from a professor at a, not this institution, but an equivalent kind of institution, and not a law professor, and talked about the relationship between, the professor talked about the relationship between himself and the person, and I was struck. I, I, I'm not sure I've ever gotten a four-page single-space letter from a professor at a major university on behalf of a law clerk application, never mind a defendant like in facing sentencing. And um, so I said, I, I was moved by it, I wanted to hear from the person, and it was a hotly contested case, notwithstanding the mandatory minimum, the government was looking for a substantially higher sentence. And so the person came and testified and spoke about this ongoing relationship, the long-term relationship he had with the defendant, but also ongoing even while the person had been in custody for several years in pretrial detention. And um, one thing led to another, and the short version is I raised the possibility that he do restorative justice then, and that I delayed a sentencing for him to do that. And, uh, and in the end, that happened. The prosecutor objected, and we had a back and forth about that. And in the end, I said, well, he, I was going to do it. And he was, he was going to have the opportunity, and it was up to him to decide. And he did it. And I think, and I don't know what the answer will be because the person's still in prison, but um, one of the things the prosecutor said to me was, besides don't do it, was why can't this happen on supervised release after the prison sentence? And I said, well, because I'm thinking about him and the prison guards because they're going to be living together for a long period of time. And whatever I decide, whether I impose the mandatory minimum or I exercise the discretion I had to give a, a longer sentence, they're going to be living together. And I think that there's no downside for him doing restorative justice. And if he does this, he may put him in a different place. That may help him do the time in a different way. That may be good for him, may put him in a different place when, for that whole experience. And that may be to the benefit of the prison guards. And so, so whether at after the end of 10 years, which is obviously a long sentence, whether will it stay? I mean, I don't know, but I think so. And, and to your point, would it be not, I have recommended, I'm not sure I did in that case, but I have recommended to the Bureau of Prisons at different times that the person participate in a restorative justice program. Now, they don't have one, I don't think. So it may be a, um, a legal fiction, as they say, to recommend it, but I, it seems to me I can recommend it and and so that would be, I think, what would be helpful in a case like that. I think more, but. Um, speaking on going through the program and somebody that's been in prison for a long time, once you hear stories like Carissa, once you damage your community and you got a chance to fix it, you never want to go back to that. Like I never want to hurt nobody again by my actions or my third party actions or whatever it may be, you, that program digs deep into your life and how you want to change the community, even a sense if you can the world. But once you do that program, I, I don't think a person will come home and want to go back to that lifestyle because of the stories or the, what you committed or what you thought of yourself. And that, what, what that really is testimony to, I think, is that actually you all look up here and think that I'm the most powerful person because I have that word honorable in front of my name, but that's actually wrong. The most powerful person on this panel is Clarissa and um, not me. I can order people to do all sorts of things. It doesn't mean they're going to do it. And, and the, authority, the things I have to enforce, those things are rather limited range of tools. But I'll tell you a story that um, a woman named Janet, who um, facilitates most of the circles that we've done our restorative justice program, her son was murdered. And she, I heard her tell the story, she told the story that that night there were a lot of people at her apartment after her son had been murdered and a lot of young people who knew her son and maybe knew some of the people who were responsible, I don't know. But she said revenge was in the air. And you can imagine how revenge was in the air. Revenge is sort of a deep and ancient, right, and present feeling, right, that people have. And 
So what she said she did, and I don't know where this came from or how she found the human strength to do it, but she said she convened a circle or several circles with various cohorts of young people who she knew and knew her son. And, um, to, and one of the things she demanded of them and got them to promise was on her sons that no blood would be shed in the name of her son. And 10 years later, when she told this story, and I heard her tell the story, she said none had been. And I thought, wow, that, that's power, and that's public safety, right? And that's something really meaningful. And that, I think, is really what JC is talking about, right? So I think it probably would. I'm hopeful it will stick. Can I say something on that as well? So also, when you talk about um, the RJ inside the walls, like there are prisons that are practicing restorative justice. And thank you, Judge. Um, but all glory and honor goes to God because that's why I'm sitting here today. Um, the restorative justice, to be able to go inside and then you're, you're, you're sharing your truth and people get to see you and see your truth and, and they get to see your pain and just the fact that they didn't harm my son but they harmed somebody else's family member and they get to see like when we talk about our pain, especially at different times, it comes out so raw. They don't want to hurt again. And a lot of times, they don't think that they're hurting anybody. When you're beefing in the community, I'm beefing with my ops, my enemy. They don't see them as human being people. Excuse me. <coughs> it's, it's like going back and forth with the gang thing, you know, the street life. But to really be sitting still, and you got family saying, that op, that enemy was my child. Right now, they can really think, like, wow, this is what I've done. And then they see you. I'm somebody's mother. What about your mother? So we keep bouncing back accountability and keep bringing it back to them as a reality of what it really is. RJ and the prisons are real. And I bear witness to a lot of transformation before my eyes with individuals that have been there 10, 15, 20, 30 years who never owned what they did. And we go through there and we begin this work. And now you got men. I've seen men fall to the floor and say, I did it. I've, I've seen men say my mother and my father died for leaving this lie. But I did it. When I forgave the men that killed my son, I freed myself. That was the biggest thing I ever did. That was a blessing. Because I walked in that courtroom feeling heavy and bondage. But when I said I forgive you and I gave them back what they did to me, that was everything. I freed me, right? So we are in a place that we're being surrogates for people and we're saying to them, we forgive you. They want to be forgiven, but they can't speak to the person who done it. So we, we tell them honestly, like, we forgive you. Now they're free. Now they want to, like you say, they want to give back now. And they're spreading, they, they, they continue planting the seeds of RJ. So RJ, we have these seeds that we plant in our words that is growing. And that's what you see right here on the stage. It, it was given to me by Janet. She mentored me to be where I am today. Patience, when I was angry going through it, she just said, go, go through it, breathe through it, like she was there. But now, I really thank her any chance I get, because if it wasn't for her, I may not be sitting here today. If it wasn't for God for us, but if it wasn't for her, on a human sense, I may not be here today. But um, if we have the time, I do want to read the letter, only because the letter is restorative justice. And Rise was, it? I don't know where you got the name Rise from. I didn't tell you. Well, wherever it came. I didn't come no. to the So wherever rise came from, if you hear the word rise, mm -hmm. right? Rising. People are coming up out of these holes. People are coming up, leaving me. Because what was done to me put me in a dark hole. And I riz up. Individuals who's harming, they're learning how to be. They're rising up. I encourage you guys, rise up. I know it's a lot going through y'all minds. Y'all may want to get out here and put some things together and get going. Yo, get it. Get it popping. Ain't nothing holding <laughs> you back but you. It's time for change, y'all. We talking about building our community and making this world safer. I still got five kids at home. I got six grandchildren. And I'm going to continue to rise because I need our world to be safe. We talk about Martin Luther King and different ones, Rosa Parks, who 
They did everything they gave up their life for. It's us now. We have to do that. And by creating programs like Rise and birthing what y'all are feeling within, like birthing it into the world, to the community, only we can save each other, only we can impact change. And it's time for change. Because I would never want no one to go through the pain that I have to endure every day of my life. My daughter, she wears her brother on. Miss Shawnee, can you stand up and show your brother? He has such a beautiful <laughs> smile. That's my son. But we have to wear items to hold on to. So I'm your, your time was to get up, y'all. You wanna read it? Any questions? This is the letter that Carissa mentioned. Dear Clarissa Turner, eight years ago, you wrote me a letter. I have kept that letter saved and have not read it for several years now, up until just a few nights ago. Ever since I read it these last few nights, I've been up late responding to it, only to find myself balling up almost every letter I've started, just after writing a few sentences. I never thought writing a letter would be this hard. Reason being is I almost couldn't find the right words to express how sorry I am for the role I played in causing your son's death. No matter what words I use, I feel that saying sorry isn't enough for robbing you and your loved ones of Willie. A couple of months before that fateful night, I myself was almost a murder victim to gun violence. Now I say that to say this, it doesn't make what happened to your son right. It don't justify our actions. I just want you to understand my thought process at the time all of this is happening. I became consumed with fear and paranoia. I thought that I can be killed at any given moment. And that made me angry because anger was the only emotion that could conceal my fear. And I allowed that fear and anger to dictate my actions. Looking back 11, 12 years ago at my younger self, I realized how confused I was on how life was supposed to be lived and how growing up in a single parent household in the projects allowed for a lot of negative influences in my life. I also had to grow up fast and learn a lot of what I know as I went on the streets. 11 years later, I realized a lot of what I was taught growing up was wrong, which led to my poor judgment and poor choices that caused your son's death. Even though I pled guilty, I blamed everything and everyone but myself. At the time, pleading guilty was the easy way without really taking responsibility for my actions. I thought after I got sentenced that this bad dream will kind of just go away, but I was wrong. And all these years later, I still can't, st I'm sorry, I st all these years later, I still can't stop thinking of that night that changed the course of my life. Just up until a few years ago, as I've gotten older, I started to forgive myself for the pain that I caused. I had to look in the mirror and face myself. I had to hold me accountable for the decisions I made and stop blaming people for the direction I chose to go in. Rereading your letter all these years later changed some of my perspective on life and how I want to live minds. I know that I still have a purpose and can be good to make a difference. I know saying sorry can never restore your son's life, but I believe in atonement, and that's why I'm doing everything in my power to better myself. I've had a few bumps in the road. While here, though, I've completed almost every program, I'm also taking this step to share my story, to share our story so people can hopefully see the power of forgiveness. It doesn't change what we've we done but these are the steps I'm willing to take so you can know your son's life and your forgiveness was not in vain. Lately, I've been thinking about the day I was sentenced to spend the next 15 years in prison. I remember it like it was yesterday when you went up there and gave your impact statement. You forgave us for all the pain we caused you. I put myself and my family in your shoes. I thought about how my mother would feel if she lost me and if she will have the strength to do what you are doing. 
Going through with this, I can't help but wonder if meeting with you will be my first real step towards the transformation I'm seeking for. Even though I'm constantly evolving and taking the necessary steps to do so, this is the biggest step to righting my wrongs. And hopefully this meeting brings us closer to what we are looking to get out of it. This is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, and I just want to thank you for everything. Thank you for your time, your forgiveness, and for the words you have, the work you have been doing. You are a powerful woman. And again, sorry for your loss and the permanent pain I cause. Sincerely, in his name. Do you want me to read this? No. Okay. So that's restorative justice. And he said to me, only if there was someone who came and seen about me the way you see about others before I did what I did, I wouldn't have done what I done. And when I go into the prisons, I hear men say that all the time, only if. So rise is the only if, because you're meeting people before they get here, right? In different areas, in different crimes that are being committed. This is what rise is doing, this is what rise has done, is created a pathway that individuals don't have to get here. So that's why rise is so important. And one more thing I wanted to share, Ms. Janet Connors, who we talking about, this young man, this Easter, he killed someone in 1993. And he was on the South End. And he created, he built a cross that he put on his back and he was walking up and down the South End in the honor of the person that he killed. Carried, what it say, carrying a message of faith, redemption, so you have individuals who are out here harming and hurting, and they want to repair. But restorative justice has been an introduction to what repair and harm looks like. And that's the blessing in this work, because in the midst of all this pain and all the, the uh, madness that's going on in the world, life goes on. So what do we do? You know. And I have taken for granted restorative justice. <clears throat> I've taken for granted the opportunities that God has placed before me to do the work that I do and I will continue to do. Thank you, Maria, for this opportunity. Jamie, thank you. Judge Soroka, thank you for allowing me to be present um, today to speak and share my story, well, my testimony of God's amazing grace and restorative justice. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I forget about Juicy. <laughs> Should we? One more? Fine, one more question. Go ahead. I was just going to respond a little bit also to that prior question. I mean, I want to say thank you to everybody because I think your stories are the most powerful things, much more than talking about the theories <clears throat> and of restorative justice, is to hear the stories. Um, and I just in response to the question about, you know, what, are you, what can you do in terms of people getting out of prison, um, there are people, amazing people, who have either created restorative programs, incarcerated people, who have created their own restorative programs in prison, and some of those people and others are doing restorative work for reentry to support people. And I think the question is, I mean, in Philly, there's Let's Circle Up. In New York, we now have the Transformational Prison Project, Noble Williams and Armand Coleman, who were incarcerated in the Norfolk Prison outside of Boston for a long time, and they are now working with young people and working with people who are being released. But the question is, if we have a prison system and the purpose of it is to keep people safe, to keep the rest of us safe, and to um, stop crime, why isn't the money that's going into the prison system thinking about the follow-up? And you know, why do we stop? We put people in prison and then we're done. And often people get released in the middle of the night. I used to be a public defender in New Jersey. They would release people, drop them off at the Newark train station um, after prison. I mean, we, where does the money come from for these volunteers, these formerly incarcerated people who are doing this hard work? It should be funded from, instead of funding more prisons, funding what are we going to do to help prevent future harm and to help support people who have been incarcerated because people are doing the work but they're not getting paid for it. And the money, that's what we need to think about, I think, is that how do we, how do we enable this kind of work and why isn't the support there? 
um, from these systems that we start by putting people in prison, but we don't really try to keep people safe because we don't follow up. So that's a great segue to this last comment I'll end on, which is that, well, I'm not a legislator and I don't have authority over budgets or I have no budget um, at all. I, I will say this, so one way, the way I think about what we're doing with this and um, program that are sort of just, so I think of it as a public safety program and that's what it is. And so, um, and that's what its purpose is. It's not its only purpose, but that's a, 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 an effect and a purpose. And so I think one thing to think about is language. There's a lot of people who um, I used to have, used to run a, before when I was a magistrate judge, I started a drug court, a, a post-prison drug court for people under federal supervision. And the scuttlebutt at the courthouse was that some of the more uh, people who thought they were tougher than me um, uh, most of whom were in law enforcement or U.S. Marshals, were, the, were sometimes colloquially called the drug court hug -a thug And no one ever had the courage actually to say that to me. And, um, but my response was, well, honestly, if I could hug a thug, and that would mean that they were sober, employed, and law-abiding thereafter, like, you don't have the, the strength and courage to do it, I would do it, what's the problem? And if that did it, that would be, like, that would be great. And so that would be a beautiful thing, and that would be cheaper, faster, and better. And so I'm not doing that because I'm not persuaded that's actually the solution, but like, what's wrong with that? And, so the, and the question is, are you interested in public safety or are you interested in just not hugging people, right? And so if you don't want to hug people, then don't hug people. But like, the real question is, are you interested in public safety? And so this is, and I think in a way, that's sort of like it's a question of language and function, and, and so, that's my view of this. Anyway, so I really want to just thank everyone on the panel, but particularly JC and Clarissa, because they have uh, done something that Maria and I haven't, which has really uh, made themselves open and vulnerable and shared personal experiences in a way that us professionals don't typically do and at things like that. So I really do appreciate not only what they did today, but what they're doing generally. And so thank you. Okay. Do we have a break or just the next panel? Why don't we take like a five minute break so folks can sign for if they need CLE and then we're going to reconvene promptly at 3.05 if we could. All right, everyone, we're going to get started with the second panel, which has morphed into um, some remarks that are going to be given by Seema Gajwani. Um, she is special counsel for juvenile justice reform uh, and Chief of the Restorative Justice Section at the DC Office of the Attorney General. She is also an NYU Law alum, so we're very happy to have her back. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you to Courtney and Judge Sorokin for inviting me uh, to speak here today. This is um, a great honor. I feel a little bit like I have been stood up at the altar. Um, that hasn't happened to me, but I've been stood up at the podium. <laughs> I was very excited to be on a panel with Meg Reese uh, from uh, District Attorney Bragg's office uh, because they're doing really incredible work um, around diversion and uh, restorative justice, and it's something you all should look into. Um, but they have, uh, they're busy. Congress is meddling in their affairs, which I live in Washington, D.C., and I can tell you that that has happened to us, and it doesn't feel good. Um, so I totally understand, and I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, a restorative justice program and the work that we're doing in Washington, D.C. And whenever I talk about our work, I like to start by uh, telling the story about how I learned about restorative justice several years ago. But I have to say that the stories that you heard on this first panel um, were really just incredible, and I want to thank um, the entire first panel, but in particular, Ms. Turner and Mr. Anderson for your stories. Uh, and my heart goes out to you, Ms. Turner, and your daughter um, for the, the great struggle that you've been through and the courage that you had to speak today about something so fresh that happened recently in your meeting 
with this gentleman who caused your family so much pain. So thank you for that. Um, when I started restorative justice, I was quite a skeptic. I thought that restorative justice sounded kind of soft. I didn't know how you would implement it, how you would operationalize something like this. Um, I also didn't know why victims of crime would ever agree to do restorative justice. I was working at the DC Office of the Attorney General. Uh, and in DC, the DC AG's office is the exclusive prosecutor for all juvenile crime. We don't prosecute most of the adult crime in the District of Columbia. That is done by um, the US Attorney's Office in our jurisdiction. Um, but for work, one day, so I was hired on uh, with the then incoming attorney, DC Attorney General Carl Racine, and I was hired as special counsel for juvenile justice reform. So one day I was at Ballou Senior High School, which is a large uh, urban high school in Washington, DC. I was there for work, and I happened upon a woman named Ivy Hilton, who was a restorative justice facilitator, and she'd been brought to the school to teach the some of the staff about restorative justice under a new principal who was interested in bringing restorative justice to this high school. And uh, Miss Ivy was uh, facilitating a restorative justice meeting the day that I happened to be there and she said, why don't you just come along and sit in on it? And it was about a fight between two high school students, um, two boys, it wasn't actually really much of a fight. It was like one boy just beat the lights out of another boy in a classroom, uh, punching the other boy repeatedly in the face until a teacher pulled him off. Um, and this had been a few days. So I was there on a Monday and this had happened maybe on the Friday, but when the smaller boy came into the room that I was in, you could still see the swelling on his face. You could see the red in the white part of his eye. I'll call him Darren for privacy. And he was there with his mother and his aunt. They were talking about how bad his face looked on Friday. They were super angry, super upset. Darren was pretty quiet. And then a little while later, the other boy came into the room, and I'll call him Malik. And Malik was there with his mother and his mother's fiance. And Miss Ivy had us all sit down in a circle she had arranged with chairs with no table in the middle. And we all sat down together and she did introductions and some ground rules. And then she turned to Malik and she said, tell the group what happened starting from the very beginning. Now Malik was a bigger kid than Darren. He was in all ways, he was taller, he was thicker, he was just a, a, a far larger kid. And that made sense to me, big kid, pummels, smaller, weaker kid end of story. But then Malik started talking and he was very quiet, um, seemed very shy, and he was looking down and he was hunched over and he was fidgeting and he, uh, you could almost not hear him and he said, um, they, were, they were calling my name, but it wasn't my name, they kept doing it. And so as Miss Ivy like pulled the story out of him, it became clear that these boys, Darren among them, had been needling him and teasing him about his name, and it had been going on for weeks. And so um, Miss Ivy asked um, the group to go around, or no, she asked Darren, she talked to Darren first. She said, Darren, tell us what happened um, from your perspective. And he was like, nothing, I didn't do anything. I was just sitting there and, this, and then he came over and started punching me. And so then Miss Ivy asked everyone in the circle to go around and say what they heard from Darren, and also if it reminded them of anything from their childhood. And um, one person said, I don't think Darren's telling the full story. Another person said, um, you know, as a child, I was bullied and that was really hurtful and it, it was very painful for me. And then it came around to Darren's mother and she was like, Darren is a joker and he thinks he's funny and he's always joking around, and he doesn't realize that he can really hurt somebody and he can get hurt himself. And so this was the way that we started this, this circle. Um, they, the family talked and the, um, the, youth, the boys talked about you know, what happened. The mothers talked about 
how they didn't raise their children like this, that they didn't approve of violence. Um, Malik's mother talked about the fact that she worked two jobs to raise her kids, and she had to miss work on Friday when she got the call from school, and she had to miss work again on Monday when the school called her for this meeting and how her boss was gonna be mad. Um, Darren's mom at some point started talking about her son, and she looked at him and said, you know, people look at black boys in Southeast DC and they assume that they're violent and dangerous, and I know that you're not a violent or dangerous child, but I just don't want you to end up dead. I don't want you to be a number, and she starts to cry. Both parents eventually apologize to the other parents for what their son did. Malik's mother said to Darren's mother, if I see you on the street, you'll know that you have a friend. She said, you know, I heard a lot of rumors about what happened in this fight in the neighborhood over the weekend. I heard that your son called my son a bee. I heard you were gonna bring people to this meeting. She said, I woke up this morning and I said, Lord, I'm going down to Baloo to brawl today. And that's why I brought my fiance with me. And she said, but now I see that we've actually made friends. She said, I don't think this should have happened, but what I do wanna do is thank the boys because they've brought our families together. Now the boys themselves were super uncomfortable. This was like very difficult for them. It was really hard, for one, for Malik to admit what he did to everybody in the room. It was um, hard for Darren to admit the role that he and his friends had played in taunting Malik. And it was especially hard for them to face their mothers. You could see when their mothers started crying how like their faces were in pain. And I don't think that it was that often that they heard their mothers talk about their hopes and dreams for their sons. Importantly, the boys were watching their parents. They were watching these adults solve problems, show remorse, show empathy, and model communication. The adults around the circle, the community itself, they talked to Malik about how violence was not an appropriate response to what happened. But they did so with empathy and with compassion towards him. In fact, Malik's mother's fiance at one point mentioned that he works out at a boxing gym and he said, I can maybe bring you two boys to the gym one day so that you can channel your anger in a more positive and productive way. And I learned later that he did. He took the boys to his gym and they spent a day there. Darren's aunt um, at some point towards the very end said to Darren, what are you gonna do next time your friends want to mess with Malik? What are you gonna say to them? And he was like, nah, it's fine, don't worry, it's not gonna happen. And she was like, no, no, no. She's like, let's pretend. I'm your friends. Darren, let's go do this. And he said, nah, it's not like that. This is taken care of. He gets into character. He's, he's fine, it's done. And they go back and forth, they practice how he is gonna respond to his friends so that he doesn't do this again. And towards the end of the conference, the boys each apologized to each other. Miss Ivy made them do it twice, one time with eye contact, because <laughs> they didn't wanna make eye contact. Um, and at the end, the group came to an agreement. There were terms to the agreement, terms about how would they behave when they saw each other again at school? How were they gonna talk about this incident to their friends? How are they gonna talk about each other to their friends? How they would talk about this matter in social media? And that was it. They got up, the moms hugged, the boys did that like shoulder thing that they do, and everybody like just walked out the door. And I was like floored, I couldn't believe it. Darren was hurt with injuries. In Washington, D.C., Malik would have been charged with assault. I had been a public defender in D.C. for six or seven years when I first started out, and so I knew exactly what would happen to Malik had he gone to court. I'd seen it many times with clients of mine that were juveniles. Um, if he had gone to court, court Malik would have then been questioned, handcuffed, and arrested at his school in front of administrators, possibly in front of other students. He'd spend at least one night locked up before he was taken to court, and then in court he would be held in a cell block for many hours before finally getting to a courtroom. 
And during that time in cell block, while he's sitting there, um, a public defender, somebody like me, would come in and speak to him for a few time, for a few minutes about the details of his life and the details of his crime. And to court Malik, this person would be the one person who knew the worst of what he'd done. And this is what she would tell him. Don't admit anything. Don't talk about this to anybody. We can fight this. We might be able to beat this charge. I've got to see if the government has enough evidence. Let me do all the talking. You don't say anything. And as defense attorneys, we need to do this because we need to build trust quickly and show our client and their families that we're on their side. Because we're investing into a bank account that will pay off later when we have to have tough conversations about going to trial or taking a plea. We are also inadvertently undermining what the research shows is fundamental to a person changing their behavior. And that is taking responsibility for their actions. So eventually, Court Malik's case would be called he would go uh, in a courtroom before a judge and a prosecutor and a probation officer and a defense attorney, and all of those people discuss his fate. But none of these people will know Malik. They won't know anything about his life or his family's life. To them, Court Malik will look just like what he looked like to me when I first saw him and heard about what happened. A large teenage boy who violently assaulted another smaller kid in his class. It's an assault, it's violent, it's a poor black boy. We've seen the story before. The prosecutor and the judge, they will never treat Malik as a kid who struggled in school because he was painfully shy and lost his father when he was eight, and who takes really good care of his little sister. The prosecutor will look at court Malik and think about Darren, the victim. And as a prosecutor, it's his job to do justice for the victim and his mother and the community. And so he will prosecute fully, because that's what his job is. And back in the courtroom, a probation officer will stand up and read off every worst thing about Court Malik as he stands there, restrained, uh, and his wrists and ankles in a jumpsuit next to his lawyer, Mediocre grades, spotty school attendance, maybe hanging out with the wrong crowd. For Malik, at his age, who he is and what he thinks of himself is inordinately influenced by what others think of him. He looks tough, he looks hardened, but Malik's self-esteem is fragile. His psychological development is vulnerable. And in a courtroom, Silenced and ashamed, Court Malik will hear what is thought of him by everybody in that courtroom, and then he will deliver. We contribute to stigmatizing young people, and then they believe what we've told them, that they are unforgivable, that they are broken, that they are bad. And then we blame them for it. So eventually, Court Malik will enter a guilty plea. The prosecutor will never know that Malik felt terrible after he did what he did, and that Malik would have taken responsibility for the fight on the first day in court if he could have. At no point will Malik ever have to apologize directly to Darren, and Darren won't have to apologize for his role, however minor. And when the judge asks him if he committed the crime, Malik's lawyer will lean over and whisper in his ear, this is the time to say yes. And he'll say yes to take the plea. To Malik, none of this will feel like accountability. And to Darren, none of this will feel like justice. And then court Malik will return to school. And the underlying problem between him and Darren will not have been solved. Now Darren and his friends may be emboldened or prepared for retaliation. Now Malik will be the kid who is locked up, who has a probation officer, who is a criminal. It turns out that the very nature of prosecuting him produces a court Malik who is more wounded, angrier, and more likely to harm again. Malik will have taken a step towards the pernicious reality 
at least in Washington, D.C., that if you're born a black boy in certain neighborhoods of our city, it's more likely that you'll go to jail in your life than go to college. He'll be another statistic. And I've seen this happen again and again and again. But none of that did happen. <laughs> what happened was two boys and their families resolved this matter with accountability and fairness in an hour and a half long conversation. And so you can see why I was floored when I saw this. As I mentioned in my office, the DC Office of the Attorney General, we prosecute all juvenile crime. In 2017, we launched our own restorative justice program. And since then, a set of full-time restorative justice professionals and I have brought together victims of crime and offenders and their families and their supporters for over 250 restorative justice circles. We have successfully used restorative justice in stabbing cases, carjackings, and burglaries instead of traditional court processing. For a while, our most common cases were simple assaults and robberies. At that time, I got to meet Judge Sorokin and Maria and Jamie. And I remember one day Jamie was in my office and I told him, um, yeah, we don't do the serious crime with weapons. We don't do the gun cases, the stabbing cases, because that's politically, that's politically a, really, a really tough carry right now. And I remember that Jamie said, gosh, why would you put, why wouldn't you put those on the table? Is that what you said to me? <laughs> Why are you taking out the most important cases you should be doing? And I was like, God, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and so the next day I started thinking about how we were gonna move to taking serious violent crime for restorative justice. And uh, the reason that we do take that crime now, where the victim is interested, is because we know that handling those cases with restorative justice is the best shot that we have at changing behavior of people who've committed crime. It's the best shot we have of reducing recidivism. And the research bears that out. So the most rigorous research on restorative justice to date um, was a study that came out, I think last year, 2021, I believe. And it is a set of 12 randomized control cases done across the United Kingdom and Australia. These cases span from 1995 to 2004 and covered over 2,000 cases. And the 12 programs in different sites across these two countries, uh, they all used restorative justice as an alternative to traditional court processing and prosecution. But in some sites, they used restorative justice for juvenile cases. In some sites, they used it for adult cases. And in some sites, they used it for both. Also, in some of the sites, they used restorative justice on violent crime and nonviolent crime. Some sites, just violent. And some sites, just nonviolent crime. And they found, over across all of those 12 sites, statistically significant reductions in recidivism for those who went through restorative justice compared to those who went through regular prosecution. And that's not unusual. We um, have seen many studies, most of them are less rigorous, but many studies have shown improved, res improved recidivism results when you use restorative justice. The beauty of this study, across so much time and across so many cases, and the fact that it's a randomized control trial is because with that level of rigor in the research, you prove causation. Restorative justice does reduce recidivism. It causes recidivism reduction. But two fascinating conclusions from that study stand out to me. One was that across the sites, the recidivism reduction was greater when used for violent crime compared to nonviolent crime. And another is that restored, uh, recidivism reductions were greater when used on adults than used on juveniles. Another interesting thing about this entire set of programs, which are all funded by one funder, um, but in all these different places, was that it was police officers who facilitated the restorative justice meetings between victims and the responsible parties in all of the sites. So our work in DC is also showing reduced recidivism for youth who participate in restorative justice compared to those who go through traditional justice processing, but that is early and our results are kind of back of the envelope for right now. We're also engaging in a randomized control trial 
that was designed by outside researchers and um, were testing whether the use of restorative justice for youth charged with serious violent crime uh, reduces recidivism compared to those who don't go through restorative justice and we're also looking at other factors like victim satisfaction, culpability, shame, guilt, a bunch of other things in a qualitative study that we're also doing. But frankly, the bar of recidivism is very low. <laughs> Recent DOJ Bureau of Justice statistics, statistics um, reporting on recidivism across the country shows that at least in the adult system, recidivism rates for people leaving incarceration are 70% two years after leaving incarceration. So our corrections industry is not doing a particularly good job of correcting any behavior at all. And most criminologists agree that there is a criminogenic effect to incarceration for youth and adults. So that means that just being in the justice system, penetrating through the justice system, actually makes it more likely that you're gonna commit crime again. Danielle Sered, who works here in New York, eloquently points out that irony sometimes when she speaks. She looks at long established research showing that the core drivers of violence are stigma, isolation, exposure to violence, and diminished economic opportunities. And each of these is a hallmark of our current prison system, stigma, isolation, exposure to violence, and diminished economic opportunities. So the most basic goal of our justice system, which is to make people safe, is undermined by what we're doing in our justice system, or effectively decreasing public system, public safety every day. And perhaps one might say that our justice system should also support victims of crime, help them heal. We do a terrible job of that too. Victims of crime routinely say that their experience in the justice system was terrible. <laughs> victims of crime, many um, have said that the experience of going through the criminal justice system itself was second only to being victimized as some of the worst experiences in their lives. Research um, from surveys out of DOJ, the Office of Victims of Crime, um, that, that studies um, victims. So they've got surveys of thousands and thousands of people who've been victims of crime. They show a pattern of what victims say that they want and need after being harmed by crime. They say that they want their voice to be heard in the process. They say they want control relative to the event. They want the person who harmed them to repair the harm as best as possible. They want answers to their questions, and they want to believe that the person who harmed them won't hurt them or anybody else ever again. What victims say that they want also corresponds to what the trauma research says about what people need after experiencing trauma. Voice, agency, control, repair, that's how people heal. And our justice system gives victims of crime virtually none of those opportunities. Personally, when I started doing restorative justice, I was very curious about why victims of crime would agree to do restorative justice, agree to meet with the person who harmed them and have a conversation. And what I've learned is that some victims choose to participate in restorative justice because they are generous and charitable. They don't want to ruin somebody's life. But some victims choose restorative justice even though they're very, very angry because they need something that the court process doesn't give them. They have to walk around in the world. They may see the person who hurt them again. They might be fearful. They may be worried about retaliation after prosecution. Oftentimes they want to tell the person who hurt them how badly they were hurt, how much they were impacted throughout their lives. We hear people talk about the fact that their, their child now wets the bed, that their family gets nervous every time they leave the room, the, they leave the house. These are things that there's, they're not included in a court system, they're not included as evidence. Some victims are baffled about why this happened to them and they have questions. They are worried that they were maybe targeted, the person knows where they live, 
maybe they've changed their lives since this happened to them. They don't take the bus or the train anymore. Maybe they're worried about seeing somebody who looks like the person who did this to them. Maybe they're worried about seeing all teenagers. And it turns out that victims of crime can get many more of the things that they need to heal from restorative justice while they get virtually none of these things from the traditional court system. Now, restorative justice doesn't always work. First, we only go forward with victim permission. And in instances where the restorative justice conference, which is what we call the meeting where we bring all the parties together, when that doesn't work, or in instances where the youth doesn't stick to the agreement he promised to, or doesn't complete what we require in our program is a course of cognitive behavioral therapy. Then the case gets handed back to the prosecutor for traditional prosecution. But of almost 250 cases that we've done, less than a dozen have been handed back to a prosecutor for prosecution. As I mentioned, we've launched our own randomized control trial in our office but we've done from the beginning victim satisfaction surveys with all victims who've gone through our process, usually about six months after they've gone through the process. And what we find is very high rates of victim satisfaction. Almost 95% of victims would recommend this process to a friend, and almost 90% would do it themselves again if in a similar situation. And what I've seen is that in my office, prosecutors understand the value of restorative justice now. After a prosecutor sits in on a restorative justice circle or observes one, he will refer more cases, including more serious cases, to restorative justice instead of prosecuting. And many times we invite an observer to sit in on a circle, be it a prosecutor or a judge or a probation officer, and we often hear them say that they can't believe that after the trauma of crime that people can see each other as human beings and that they can come to resolution together. So what is it about restorative justice that is more effective at reducing crime than traditional prosecution? In my opinion, it is the difference between shame and guilt. And when I first started learning about restorative justice, somebody trained me and they showed a video of Brene Brown talking about shame and guilt. And at the time, I didn't know how famous she was. Um, I just thought it was like a random video, but now I realize she's like a rock star. But in that video, which I've pulled up since then again, because um, I wanted to get the words right, make sure I, I remembered it correctly. She says, shame says, I am a bad person. And guilt says, I did a bad thing. She says that shame is highly correlated with addiction, depression, self-harm, and violence. But that guilt is different. She says that guilt is inversely correlated to those things. With guilt, there is a path built in to redemption. And because you're not the bad person, but you did a bad thing, you can also be better, change yourself, and make things right. So the ability to hold something we've done or failed to do up against who we want to be, that's incredibly adaptive and productive. It's uncomfortable. What I used to always tell young people when I was doing restorative justice conferences before they started their conference, I would say, this is gonna be the hardest thing you have to do, to look at the person in the eye who you've hurt and tell them what you've done. And I know this because as an adult, it's hard for me to do, to do that. Even when I've hurt somebody, most recently a sibling, <laughs> and I've done something wrong, it's really hard to look at them in the face and tell them what you've done wrong. But that's actually when you start to change your behavior that is the core of behavior change. It's how we learn from our mistakes. And when we do things intentionally, as I did to my brother, um, we also learn how to not do it when we have to face and admit what we've done and hear how badly that hurts somebody. And I think that's the heart of restorative justice. We had a case um, a couple of years ago in which a young person tried to rob a woman. And in the process she resisted, she was in a panic, and he shot her, and the bullet grazed her body. And so a restorative justice facilitator, 
and my team went and spoke to the young person, and he's immediately, effusively remorseful. I didn't mean for this to happen. I'm so sorry. Please tell this lady I'm sorry. And so the facilitator goes and speaks to the woman, and she is totally traumatized and scared. But after thinking about it, she decides that she's open to doing restorative justice. And so the facilitator starts working with this victim for a while, checking in every week, going and spending time with her, just as she's working and preparing with the young person as well. But the victim, week after week, is just not able to talk about what actually happened to her. And so usually our facilitators don't disclose anything that either side has said until they come together and they meet and they can talk together. But in this case, the facilitator decided that she would ask. So she went to the boy and she asked him, would you be okay if I shared some of the things you've said with this woman? And he said, yes, you can tell her. And so then our facilitator went back and tells the victim that this young person said he wants her to know that he is so sorry and that he hopes that she is okay. And when she says these things, he just breaks down, she just breaks down in tears, sobbing, sobbing for a while. And at that point, it's the first time that the victim is able to start talking about what happened to her. Now, this case was very unusual, I think in part because it was, the, it was one of our first cases during COVID. Um, and at the, now virtually none of our cases go to sentencing or disposition in juvenile court because when a young person does restorative justice, it's heavily incentivized, and in many of the cases, the case is ultimately dismissed if they're fully successful with the program. But in this case, for some reason, the case went to sentencing, and um, everyone was at this hearing, and it was over video because it was a virtual hearing, and on the video, there was the judge, the lawyers, the restorative justice facilitator, this young person, his mother, the victim of the crime. And the judge instructed at some point, the judge kind of goes through the normal script of what you do at a sentencing hearing. And at some point he turns to the victim and says, okay, now is the time for you to read your victim impact statement. And um, it turns out that this woman had done a victim impact statement. She had written this out at the very beginning of the case with a prosecutor or a victim witness specialist when the case first came in. And so she took it out and she started to read it. And I wasn't there, but our facilitator was there. And apparently it was this very long statement and it was pretty harsh. And towards the end, she says, you should be ashamed of yourself. I hope your mother is ashamed of you. And I hope your father, if you even have a father, is ashamed of you. And then the judge turns to this young person and says, do you have anything to say? And he says, no. He didn't read a letter that he had written to this woman for this hearing that he had prepared. And later the restorative justice facilitator called him and he said, I don't wanna do it anymore. I don't wanna do the meeting. I don't wanna meet the lady anymore. And so the facilitator called his mom and the mom said that um, when he went back, so he was being held at a juvenile facility, a detention facility, and they bring you down to a video room to do hearings and video calls. And after the hearing was done and he was being taken from the video room to his unit where he was staying, um, they actually didn't bring him back to his unit. They took him to another unit um, for young people who are on suicide watch. And that restorative justice conference never happened. And I tell you this because even things that we think are innocuous in our judicial process, even things that we think are just, like a victim impact statement, they can cause harm and shame without the dialogue of accountability and understanding, without the redemption part and that means, like in this case, the victims don't get healing and offenders don't build empathy or consequential thinking. And then crime doesn't go down. And so I ask myself, if we continue to get such poor outcomes out of our criminal justice system, why do we hold on to it? 
And I think it's because our justice system was really built for trials. The procedural protections that are written into the Constitution and into our laws that are there to protect people, they're there for trial. And for trials, the system actually is quite brilliantly tuned, right? Like in a trial where somebody is contesting their guilt, um, where they want to test the government's evidence, where they want to go to trial, then we do want to sterilize the criminal event. We do want to li limit the victim's voice and role. We want to take out all the emotion we can. We do want to silence the defendant so that they don't incriminate themselves and empower the attorneys who do all the talking. And so that's what our court system is for. It's for trials. Only we never go to trial, right? We have a judicial system where 95% of cases end in a plea. And 5%, probably less than the federal system, end up going to trial. So it's a beautiful system that's been designed for 5% of the cases. Whereas when someone takes a plea, weeks or months after a crime, when they stand up in court and they finally admit that they're guilty, no one asks them to apologize for what they've done, not to the victim, not to the community. By the time you take the plea, no one would believe it anyway. <laughs> If the truth is contested, then trial is appropriate. But if trial truth isn't contested, it's just about losing or winning a conviction, and for what and for how long. In these cases where somebody takes a plea, what we've done is we've created a system that is particularly bad for behavior change. We've done, we've created the kind of the perfect system where somebody doesn't take responsibility for their actions. They don't have to be confronted with the impact of their harm. They don't have to apologize. They don't have to talk about what they're going to do to change themselves to not do this again. And so in Washington, D.C., in our program, we check under the protections of confidentiality. Restorative justice facilitators check with the young person who's charged with a crime, his family and lawyer first. Because when a young person is willing to take responsibility, we know that as a system, if we encourage them not to take responsibility, we're making it less likely that he will change his behavior in the future, less likely that he will learn from his mistakes. And frankly, even when we do go to trial, sometimes it's because the lawyers want to battle each other. <laughs> we had a case um, where five boys assaulted an adult on the Metro platform in Washington, D.C. And during the fight, this gentleman fell onto the rails of the track and was badly injured and was in great, great danger. Um, the prosecutor offered pleas. The charge was kind of a high charge. The prosecutor offered pleas to kind of felony assault, like a middle level and said, if you do restorative justice, you can take this plea. It was a serious case, so it wasn't a case where the charge would be dismissed at the end if successful. Um, and so our facilitator went and spoke to four of the five boys involved in this case, and they all agreed to do restorative justice. The victim had also agreed to do restorative justice, so we were moving towards that process. Um, but one defense attorney, who came from the same office that I was a public defender at, so I get it, one defense attorney refused to let the facilitator talk to her client and said, if you want my client to do restorative justice, then you have to give him an even better plea. Because if I go to trial, I'll probably lose on that middle charge. And so there's no, there's no reason for me to take this plea. You've got to make it even sweeter. This prosecutor was not having it. <laughs> She dug in and said, no, I'll see, you. I'll see you in court, right? I'll see you in trial. That's what we do as lawyers. Um, and so what happened was one of the five boys was going to trial in this case. And so the victim and the other, five, the other four boys had to pause and wait on the restorative justice conference until the trial was over to see what happened in that case. And so at trial, the government prosecutor um, put on her case and rested her case in chief. And before the defense um, started her case, the judge called for a recess. It was just a normal break. And in Superior Court in DC, there's like one bathroom for the whole floor. And so during this recess, 
the um, victim goes to the bathroom and he's washing his hands and in comes the young person who is charged with the crime, who is going to trial against him. And they look at each other and the young person said, I'm really sorry that I did this to you. And the guy was like, oh, thank you. And then he went to the bathroom and washed his hands, everybody's done. And the victim goes back to the courtroom and he's just sitting there and at some point like the prosecutor comes to talk to him and the victim says to the prosecutor, you know, I don't think this kid is that such a bad kid. Uh, he just said sorry to me in the bathroom. And the prosecutor was like, he said sorry? <laughs> All the prosecutors in the room left because her eyes were like wide open. She just, she just won her case, right? So she tells the judge she wants to reopen the case in chief. She calls the victim to the stand. Turns out there was an officer in the bathroom in a stall, so she's got two witnesses. She puts the victim back on the stand, and she said, what did this boy say to you? Because it's a statement against interest. And um, the judge was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> The defense attorney is like crushed. She's so mad, right? She's watching this case, you know, go down the, the tank. She's just lost the case and she's just deflated and defeated that this happened. It turns out that the judge actually made everyone stop the case and figure things out because she knew about restorative justice and she realized what was going on. But this, in truth, was a battle between these lawyers in the theater of court. What was lost was the fact that this victim was ready to forgive and that this young person needed to apologize. And so why would these lawyers be so agitated when it's good for a young person to apologize for what they've done and it's good for a victim to move forward after they've been hurt? We want these young people to change their behavior, to learn from their mistakes. And this young person was ready to start with a genuine apology, and here the lawyers wouldn't let it happen. They had to win, right? Somebody had to lose. It's a zero-sum game. That's how the adversarial system works. The judge stopped the trial. The case went to restorative justice, this time with the five young people. And the co-facilitator, we have two people facilitate every conference. The co-facilitator in this case was um, had got sick or something, so I got to sit in and watch, be a co-facilitator on this matter. And I remember that, that that young person, the one who went to trial, I remember after this long, emotional, it was like a lot of people, so there were like two, it was two or three hours, lots of crying, lots of like vulnerability and um, emotion. Um, this young person said to the man who he hurt, um, I'm, so impressed by you, I feel like I've learned so much from you. And so the facilitator on cue says, what have you learned? <laughs> and he says, I've learned that you can forgive anything. And I was like, that's the lesson, right? I have this quote scribbled on a post-it note in uh, my office on the wall. It says, the challenges of the future will not yield to the solutions of the past and we must build the possibility of failure into our calculus. I was a public defender. I was that public defender. <laughs> Probably would have gone to trial myself. I worked as a funder. I funded systems change. I funded advocates. Um, and it didn't really work. Nothing changed in the system. But my office has changed. Our prosecutors have changed. We had a case last year that involved a dangerous shooting in broad daylight that left a person paralyzed for life. Um, and after the shooting, there were threats of retaliation towards the family of the victim and the neighborhood. Um, and family members were a central part of the government's evidence in this case. And just like in the neighborhood, the lawyers on both sides were prepared to go to war, to go to trial which would have fought, caused further destruction to both sides, the victim, the family of the victim, the accused. And for everyone, including the defense attorney and the prosecutors, the stakes felt so high. It was a serious, dangerous case. But the defense attorney and the prosecutor laid down their arms. They gave it all up. These parties, 
the people who are impacted by this crime, they knew each other. The young people and the families knew each other from the neighborhood. They used to be friends. And this zealous defense attorney told our restorative justice facilitator who she trusted, listen, my client tells me he didn't do it, but I think he might have. And I think if you talk to him without me there, he might admit this to you, and then you might be able to do restorative justice. This is unheard of. And the prosecutor on the verge of trial knows what is right for these people. She knows what's right for this victim's family and what's right for this neighborhood. And so she swallows her pride and she gives in to what her opponent, the defense attorney, very unreasonably asked for, which was a ridiculously light plea. And she gives in. And for both sides, there was no guarantee of success. There was no win at the end of this process. But they both did what they knew was right, which is they took the criminal justice system off the table. And so in doing, there was reconciliation. This young man met with the family in a restorative justice conference. All of the parties cried for the entire two hours. The conversation was emotional. I wasn't there, I heard about it. And the situation was resolved as best as was possible. There was no retaliation. There was no future violence in this neighborhood around this incident. The war had ended. And there's one more quote I'm gonna say. It's a beautiful quote by uh, Rumi, who is a 13th century Sufi poet. And I always think about that in situations like this. The quote is, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. And just a few weeks ago, the same kind of thing happened again in my office. This time it was a pretty cruel and um, traumatic assault that resulted in deep injury and trauma to the victims. And the young person who committed this crime had a history of dangerous and harmful behavior. And our best trial prosecutor was assigned this case. She said she could try this case with her eyes closed. Exact words. The defense attorney, who had not been able to convince her client to take any plea, because he insisted that the witnesses would be too intimidated to come to court, um, talked to our facilitator. Because somehow it became clear to both sides, the attorneys on both sides, that trial was not the right thing to do for this case. The facilitator made a lot of inroads with the victims of this crime, one of whom had a panic attack every time the crime was spoken about. She would just fall apart. And each lawyer knew what was needed in order to do the right thing to allow for restorative justice, and they did. On the prosecutor's side, she took virtually all the serious charges off the table. The defense attorney handed her client over to our facilitator with the hope that this might work. And the facilitator spoke to this young person who committed the crime. And when he was faced with what he needed to do for these victims who he knew from the community, he agreed to do the right thing, the hard thing and that is to apologize and to offer them the peace and safety that they desperately needed. He had been working for some time with this facilitator, talking about getting out of his life, out of the streets, and he'd already started taking steps to doing so. And it turns out now that the restorative justice conference in this case will not change his sentence and yet he still is committed to doing it. He knows that he needs to do this, and this meeting will probably happen in the next couple of weeks, actually. The families will talk about their histories, they'll discuss conflict resolution and dignity, and they will find healing. We are all confident that they will. And these are just a few cases of what we see when people are committed to accountability and empathy and healing and behavior change. And it also shows how we all lose when we pick sides and we prepare for battle at all costs. Because what that does is it leads us to dehumanization, shame, distrust, and greater crime. We all are public servants. We are empowered with the duty to make things better for the public, both the victims of crime and those charged with crime. 
And for us in the juvenile justice system, we believe that it should have one single goal, and that is to help young people learn from their mistakes and change their dangerous behavior. And instead, in our justice system, in the juvenile justice system, for sure, we make them worse. Because at every juncture, we stigmatize, we shame, we dehumanize, and we're not doing much for victims for their closure either. And so it's important that we acknowledge that we are doing this and go back to first principles, that our justice system has failed to do what we probably should have been centering as the core principle, which is to help people learn from their mistakes and commit less crime. Now, restorative justice isn't perfect. It's not for every case, but it does offer the possibility of answering these questions and addressing these problems. Victim closure and healing is centered. Offenders are more likely to change their behavior. Communities are more likely to be safer in the long term. And importantly, it's a process that honors the humanity and dignity of all people, those who commit crime and people who've been harmed with, by crime. And it offers all of them what they need to give them the opportunity and the chance to flourish. Is it hard? Yes. Is it the answer for everything? No. And will some people fail? Of course. But in Washington, D.C., we're dealing with serious violent youth crime with restorative justice, and we are getting better outcomes for people who've been harmed and people who cause harm. And so I'll leave you with the post-it note again. The challenges of the future will not yield to the solutions of the past. And so I suggest it's time to look for a different future for our justice system. Thank you. Courtney says questions. Anybody have any questions? How does it work operationally with the criminal justice system? Now, obviously, people can't just say, I'm sorry, and someone says, I forgive you, and that's the end of it. So how does it work operationally? Good question. Um, so what happens operationally is and this was not an easy task, putting this kind of soft um, concept into like our justice system was just like rigid and like el all elbows, you know, and to like fit it in. But what we have kind of figured out now is we have a very strong confidentiality policy that protects any statements that are made during the entire restorative justice process. From the very beginning, when we first asked to speak to a young person, to the very, very end. And so our restorative justice facilitators get permission from the defense attorney to speak to the person who's been charged and assess if they are willing to take full responsibility for their actions. So that first assessment is made. Our facilitators are also on a case that they've been assigned, speaking to the victim or the person who has been harmed and assessing if this is something that they might be interested in participating in. If both sides are ready and willing and able to do restorative justice, then the facilitator goes to the prosecutor and says, we can do restorative justice in this case, and the prosecutor makes a plea offer. Actually, in our office, they make two plea offers, a regular plea offer that they would normally make, and then another plea offer that incentivizes restorative justice, such that if the person who's charged successfully completes the restorative justice process, they get um, a better outcome. And in many cases, the case is dismissed at the end of that time. So if the young person takes the plea that includes restorative justice, then the case in court is held in abeyance. It's called a, typically it's called a deferred disposition agreement. It's kind of a, a contract between the prosecutor and the defense attorney. And the case is just kind of put on pause for a period of time, sometimes six months, nine months, a year. And then the restorative justice process happens. So in most of our cases, because we do serious violent crime, the young person has to take the plea first, and then the case is held in abeyance. And then over that period of time, our facilitator is working with both sides, preparing them for this meeting. Then they facilitate the meeting itself, and this meeting typically goes like two hours maybe, sometimes longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. And at the meeting, there are three core questions, although there's kind of a longer conversation. The core questions are what happened, 
How were you impacted? And what needs to happen to make things right? And at that last part, what needs to happen to make things right so that it doesn't happen again? There is an agreement that is written up. And that agreement is made up of terms that all the parties agree to. It's a consensus agreement. And those terms are written down and the date by which they have to be completed, who's gonna verify that it's been completed. And everyone signs this document, this agreement. And then after the restorative justice conference or meeting, um, there is a period of time where the young person has to complete all of the terms of the agreement and the facilitator monitors that. And at the completion of that, the facilitator will let the prosecutor and the defense attorney know that this person has completed all the terms of the agreement and then the case is either dismissed or it goes to sentencing with a reduced plea and um, that's it. Does that explain it? <laughs> So we've had a few cases where there are um, there's civil litigation, um, but we can't bind anybody in this civil matter. We can only bind bind the prosecutor and what evidence they can use in the criminal or juvenile matter. And so what we have found is that typically the person who is charged is more scared of the criminal liability than the civil liability, and so the process takes place despite it. Now. In some of the agreements, in the terms of the agreements, restitution is involved. And so restitution will be written in the agreement. You know, oftentimes what we see where there's restitution is there's, you know, a payment plan. You know, there's a lot of discussion about like, well, how long is it gonna take you? Well, I get paid every two weeks. This is how much I can do. This is what I can do instead. And then kind of um, uh, we verify along the way that it's been paid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, thank you for your work. This is excellent. And I have two questions. I have a lot more. But um, the first is I'm just curious if there's a defendant who is interested and really, really wants to participate, but the victim is not, is there any alternative process that's available? And then my second question is since you guys have been doing such amazing work on the juvenile side, is there any movement on the adult side to possibly um, limit what you guys have done? Thank you. Um, we actually have just in it feels like just recently, but since January of this year, we've been exploring um, the use of victim surrogates like what you all do. Um, and so we uh, are, we've done victim surrogates before, but typically they are people who are impacted by the crime. So sometimes if the young person who has been harmed doesn't want to meet with the person who hurt him, but like a parent does, mom or a dad, that, that's something that we'll facilitate, and that's kind of a surrogate, but they have certainly been harmed themselves too. Um, but what we're exploring now, and we have a bunch of cases kind of teed up, is to use somebody who's not involved at all, much like what you all do, um, who can speak about being the victim of a crime. And we were reluctant to do that for a while, in part because you know, this process is so victim-centered, and because, you know, our boss, the Attorney General, when he spoke about restorative justice, really, you know, he, he always spoke first about how this doesn't happen without victim permission. And that is a really important part of this. And even with victim surrogates, if a person who's been harmed is like, absolutely not, nobody, he should not be given an opportunity to restorative justice, I think we would still not do it. But there are many cases we have or at least many recently that I can think of where somebody has said like, look, I, I think this is a good program. I don't want this person to be you know, incarcerated, but I don't wanna meet with them. And what's been interesting in one of those cases is that our facilitator said, oh, okay, but would you be interested in being a victim surrogate in another case? And the person was like, yeah, maybe I'll do that. So that's been another interesting aspect to this. Um, on the adult side, we actually are just starting a program with our adult prosecutor, the US Attorney's Office, to get referrals for low felony offenses from them. And so we're hoping 
that should have started in January and it's already April, but we're hoping that that gets started. Um, and then we'll start doing uh, adult, adult crime too, which would be great uh, because I think one of the things that a lot of folks are worried about in DC is that this becomes seen as just a juvenile thing, right? It's just for young people, not for, not for adults who commit crime. And we know that that's, um, that's not a good use of our resources. Yeah, I think we, yeah, we're just doing it out of our budget. However, the city council was very generous with us a couple of years ago and gave us a really significant increase in our budget to uh, allow us to double our staff. So we now have 15 full-time restorative justice professionals on staff who are employees of our office. We have a social worker and I have an assistant chief, which is great. And, um, we now have the resources to be able to take capacity from the U.S. Attorney's Office, if they'll give us cases. <laughs> we'll see. Yes. I have two questions. One is, what is you talk about facilitating this? Like, what would be the use? Of it? What's the background, the training, and the supporters? And secondly, is how does your office face the backlash from um, starting this program? Well, um, I get the question a lot about what our facilitators kind of what their background is. And the truth is, is that we don't have any kind of criteria. Because we've been working on juvenile crime for so long, I typically look for people who have experience working with young people who have been justice involved. We also changed our HR requirements to prioritize people who themselves have lived experience and who match the demographics of the young people who are in our juvenile justice system. And so those are two important things um, but, you know, some of our facilitators have been social workers, some of them have been therapists, but many of them don't have any of that experience. They've done community work, there are youth workers, um, some have been educators. Um, really, they just really need to have a very high quotient of emotional intelligence. Um, your second question, backlash. I was just telling Jamie before we started this conference that I've... Um, tried to keep my head really low in Washington, D.C. And so it's funny, I talk about our work outside of D.C. quite a bit, and I don't talk about our work very much in D.C., mostly because I'm scared. It's a vulnerable program, and uh, it has the potential to kind of raise alarm among kind of the tough-on-crime crowd. Uh, and, you know, but some people know about it. <laughs> We haven't, we haven't gotten much backlash. I think one of the reasons that we're protected, in part, is because um, the person who was harmed agrees to do restorative justice. So, you know, that is kind of a protective buffer for the program. If uh, somebody's like, how dare you do this with such a serious crime? It's hard to, you know, to oppose the person who was most deeply in harmed by the crime saying, no, this is what I wanted to do, and I felt like this was the best outcome for me. So that's protective. It doesn't, it doesn't protect you entirely, but here's hoping. Um, I also have two questions. What is the time line, timeline for your program? And uh, once it takes to get to what happens if the participant violates the contract? So the case is not dismissed until after the contract has been completed. But... Um, but the time period will depend on how long the prosecutor decided to have the kind of case be held in abeyance and how long the prosecutor wanted that young person to be under supervision. And so sometimes in the more serious cases, it's a year. Typically, it's about six months. And during that time period, we're doing our work. And what we're doing is trying to have the meeting a few months before the end of that so that the terms of that contract can be completed in time. Because sometimes victims are like, I want you to do well in school, so I want you to graduate and prove to me that you've graduated, but that's in a year and a half. And so we're like, well, that's outside of the time frame that we have kind of jurisdiction. And so we'll have, we'll like kind of tailor it and talk through like, maybe he can show you his grades every six months or every term until the end of the period. Um, but we're monitoring that.
Jamie. So usually we don't do an evaluation with the um, charged person after the fact, although we are just about to have a qualitative evaluation done of our program, and that will include surveys and focus groups with people who've been through the program. So hopefully we'll learn something from that. But it always is a danger that things are going to go south during the meeting. That's why the work is so hard and so scary for our facilitators, because it's like a... It's like an unknown, you know, and emotions are high and people have been hurt and so that it, you never know what's going to happen. But our facilitators spend a lot of time preparing both sides and they really are assessing both sides, not just the person who's been charged but also the person who's been harmed to make sure that they're well suited for a restorative justice conversation. One thing that's happened a couple of times, really not very often, probably I think two times as far as I can remember is that the facilitator has decided that the person who was harmed, the victim, is not actually gonna be a good person for the conference um, at some point before they go to the meeting because the person is really committed to punishment, right? And so what we don't wanna do is harm the young person more also. And so what we're looking for is to make sure that the person who's been harmed is committed to resolution and is not looking for, is not looking to degrade or shame the person. Um, and mostly, that's not the case. On the other side, the facilitators do spend quite a bit of time with the young people to make sure that they are gonna be able to um, take full responsibility and appropriately show that. And a lot of it, in that way, is kind of a mentorship or, you know, process with the facilitator and the young person which is why it's so critically important that that person feels that they can relate to them. Um, and, you know, that's like, you know, imagine if this happened to your sister or mother or brother, and you were in this meeting, and the person who was apologizing never made eye contact with you. How would you feel about that? So how do you think you would want that person to behave, to show true respect to your sibling or mother who was harmed? and then we kind of role play. Because sometimes the young people don't have the, um, the words, really. You know, They don't have the emotional vocabulary to be able to show empathy in the way that we know is gonna be needed. And so we work with them at that. And that's actually a growing process. And a lot of the young people stay in touch with our facilitators. They grow really close to them over that period of time because I think they learn a lot from them. One question. Um, so, I, and I, you may have already answered this, but you're only taking cases with an identifiable victim into personal harm. So, if the kid's still sitting by you, you're not going to have a government server come down and be like, don't steal from the government. Yes. Um, but I have to tell you, prosecutors really want me to take the city bike theft case. Um, and they really want me to take misdemeanor cases, and they really want me to take shoplifting cases of big box stores, because these are cases that they don't really want anyway. Um, but the truth is, is that this is a labor-intensive process, and it's not a good use of our resources to spend it on a crime that is low level. And like that study showed, the impact of recidivism reduction appears to be even higher, more more pronounced where it's more serious crime. And I believe that's because what's happening is the young person is building empathy, right? I, you know, when I first started doing this, we had a case where these five kids did, um, it, was, it was at a time we called them flash mobs in DC. So like a bunch of kids would go into a 7-Eleven and just like ransack the place and then leave. And so there, are, there was like a rash of them and everybody was like all up in arms. They were, they're all caught on video, like it's a mess. And I remember it was my first case and I uh, went to the school where the five kids went to school and I went and I pulled them out of their, they pulled them out of the class one by one and I had this conversation with them each. 
and I was, I was like, so who was impacted by what you did? And they were all like, and this is what the first kid was like, I was impacted because I got locked up and I couldn't go to basketball practice and now they're trying to kick me off the team. And I'd be like, all right, well, who else was impacted? And they'd be like, oh, well, my mom is really mad at me and she had to leave work and da da da. And I'd be like, anybody else impacted by this? And they're like, can't think of anything. And that's how they all were, one after another. And then we got into this meeting. It was huge because there's so many kids. And this um, young gentleman who was an immigrant, he was an Ethiopian immigrant who was there, and he owned this franchise. He'd put like all of their life savings into it. He had a, a wife and a young child. They got the call when they were at home that the place had been vandalized. And they, and they didn't want to leave the baby at home and the, the wife wanted to be there. And so they all rushed to this place. And he said, when I walked in, I felt like my home had been destroyed. Like it felt so violative to me. And I remember I was in this meeting and one of the boys, like it was a big circle and he literally jumped out of his seat and he came halfway through the circle and he was like, I'm so sorry. Because they are so self-centered, teenagers. They're so like, the world really, I have teenagers. Like, it's so true. They just don't think about how other people are affected until they have to see it. And we see that time and time again, that like it really does change their experience to be like, oh my God. And sometimes for a little while, I would call people afterwards kind of as quality control. And I remember talking to a couple of kids who'd been through the process and I'd be like, well, what do you remember, you know, months later? And I got a lot of like, yeah, that for real, that guy, he, that sucked for him, <laughs> you know? It's because what impacted in them and what they remember is like how badly somebody was hurt. And I think that's where the transformation comes. I think we're gonna have to call time Sorry. on this. Um, as much as I think this was a great talk, so thank you, Seema. Um, if everyone can thank Seema and give her a round of applause. <laughs> can folks take like a three minute break to stretch their legs and then we'll try to keep us as on track as we can. Thank you. Thank you everyone for hanging in here in what is I know of super hot room. <laughs> Um, but this is our final panel of the day. Um, I'm really actually excited to hear um, from these panelists to talk a little bit more about sort of the challenges and the unanswered questions um, that I think folks need to grapple with if we're gonna think about um, finding space for restorative justice in the federal criminal system. Um, so to my left, we have Jamie Herbert. He's an assistant United States attorney in the District of Massachusetts and he has over 30 years of experience as a federal prosecutor, including as the former chief of the criminal division. Um, to his left is Judge Sorokin, who's back again. <laughs> um, to Judge Sorokin's left, we have Tavon Robinson. He participated in the restorative justice programming that you heard about um, in panel one, and he is now a youth mentor and community leader. And all the way at the end, we have Jessica Hedges, who is a criminal defense attorney and civil rights litigator with over 15 years of experience. She's a member of the Criminal Justice Act, or CJA panel, as well as CJA national representative for the District of Massachusetts. So thank you all. all right. thank, thank you, Courtney, um, and thank you all for sticking around. Um, uh, I'm not gonna say anyone can't leave during this segment, but uh, we really need you for, for, this, uh, for this segment. Not that we didn't need you for the prior ones, but this is gonna be a little bit more interactive and, and, and exploring the challenges, too close, uh, the challenges uh, that we face uh, going forward. Um, uh, Seema had uh, this wonderful quote about how the, the challenges of the future won't yield to the solutions of the past. Well, th in this uh, segment, we're gonna be talking about the, how the, the challenges of the future <laughs> might face uh, some of the solutions of the future as well. So it's, uh, uh, it's going to be an interesting discussion. I first, uh, first of all want to just uh, say a word of thanks uh, to Courtney and to uh, the center for putting this on, for inviting us. Uh, they've been such gracious uh, hosts and we really appreciate the opportunity to come here and have this discussion with all of you. Um, I also want to thank the prior panelists. Uh, a huge thanks to uh, Clarissa, uh, who is um, 
Chardonnay, if you watch the film uh, Circle Up, I mean, you all should, um, Chardonnay is in it, and she has one of my favorite quotes on it, which is, she says, my mom is my superhero. And uh, I love that because uh, her mom is my superhero, too. And I just, um, I'm in awe of, of the way you, um, you know, turn your pain into purpose, Clarissa. So we really appreciate that. Uh, to JC, my friend, um, we're just such great thanks for your honesty, uh, for the way you have embraced restorative justice, for the caring spirit that clearly has been in you the entire time and, and the good work that you're doing now. Um, to Maria and Judge Sorokin for giving me the opportunity to get involved in restorative justice and for the incredible work that uh, uh, they've been doing and that the, I think the brilliant program that Maria has designed. And uh, Seema, who is also one of my heroes, I don't know where she is. Oh, there she's right down front. Um, that was uh, as good a talk on restorative justice as I have ever heard. <laughs> and, and I've heard a lot of them. Um, so that was just amazing. And I think you really um, hit all of the important topics uh, and, and you know, why somebody uh, would be in favor of seeing more of this done. So, uh, so what we're going to uh, we're going to discuss are uh, the challenges a, a district might face in um, trying to implement a program like this if they were interested. Um, the, the context for this is the uh, restorative justice in the federal system, but it doesn't have to be limited to the federal system. Um, it's really this is a this is a panel on how you scale restorative justice, and that is really the big question, I think. Uh, I, know I, I heard uh, Seema mentioned Danielle Surrett, who's also a hero of uh, the restorative justice movement, and I heard her ask that question in an interview, and, and it is really the big question, and that's why we need you all, because I think there's a lot of smart people in this room. And so uh, we want to kick those ideas around. Um, we're in, in the course of that, we'll mention skepticism from various different parties, which is a significant challenge, and uh, we'll try to get to some uh, possible responses to those skeptics, although I think it's sort of C. Simo's speech is, is the response to all of them. Um, we are going to try to leave plenty of time for questions uh, at the end, but we'd like to do this a little bit differently. We would like to make this as interactive as possible. So if a question occurs to you uh, w while we're talking, please don't hesitate to raise your hand to just shout out your question to interrupt. It'll, it'll make this more interesting and it'll make for a better discussion. I don't think that's my phone, but anyway. Um, okay, so um, just for starters, um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just very briefly talk about how they got involved in restorative justice and what their background has been in it. Um, Judge Sorokin uh, has talked a little bit about it, but do you want to add anything to what you've said before? You know what? I've talked enough, so I'm okay. going to pass it to <laughs> um, I was introduced to uh, restorative justice by my uh, boss a.k.a. my lawyer right next to me, Jessica Hedges. And um, I, was in, uh, I was in the midst of um, uh, a, an open case, and she uh, asked me, just like J.C. mentioned, and uh, that, that uh, brilliant lawyer J.C. spoke about is Jessica as well. I'm finishing his story for him. But, um, you know, so Jessica, you know, asked me if I wanted to attend a circle. Um, it was at a time in my life where I was making changes already, so... Uh, I said, I'm willing to try anything, and um, I went. It was a great experience, um, which I'll probably touch on a lot more. And uh, from there, I just kept going. I went to, I came down to New York and, you know, went to training. Um, I, I facilitated a few circles, and um, I just, you know, since then, I've just been uh, involved in involving restorative justice circles and everything I do. Um, so I'm Jessica Hedges, and I'm Tavon and JC's lawyer. That's one of the, those are my proudest moments. Um, and I've been a lawyer for a criminal defense attorney for more than 20 years. I came to restorative justice. I think three three things really briefly. Number one, as a sort of mid-career criminal defense attorney who loves my clients and was incredibly frustrated about the ways in which the system, and I love their families and I love their communities, and the ways in which the system wasn't helping um, either them or their families or their communities to thrive in meaningful ways. And so I was sort of desperate and 
searching, number one. Number two, I came to restorative justice as a, as a victim of a serious crime as a young child. And um, so I was always searching for ways um, from a victim's perspective to um, make sure that other people weren't victimized. And I didn't find in my work that the system was doing anything substantial or meaningful to, towards that end. And number three, as a lawyer working in a system that um, I felt like as a sort of mid-career professional was not only not necessarily helping my, fam my, my clients, um, not my family, but my clients uh, uh, improve their lives or, or make different choices um, or their communities any safer, but, but also as a person working in the system, um, I found that the culture of the system was not only dehumanizing my clients, but dehumanizing me at some level. And not only de dehumanizing me, but people who I otherwise thought were good people, maybe a prosecutor outside the courtroom, or a judge, or a defense attorney, it was dehumanizing them. So there's something about the process of restorative justice that I felt was actually making us all better um, as, a, as a culture and as a community. Uh, and uh, that's all. Uh, thanks, and uh, just very briefly as to how I got involved in it. Um, I, as um, Courtney said, I've been a prosecutor for a long time. I think I've, um, I had a very typical prosecutor's mindset uh, before I discovered restorative justice. Um, probably was not the most sort of hard-ass prosecutor out there, but I, I definitely was not the most lenient. And um, I believed that uh, our job was to prosecute the crime and that the punishment should fit the crime and all that. And uh, somewhere along the way, I read a book about restorative justice. It uh, kind of hit me between the eyes like a two by four, much like, you know, uh, Seema's speech. Uh, it was, you know, the, just the logic of it all <laughs> was, was so compelling <clears> that I was left feeling, oh, that's great. I've devoted myself to something that's completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, that that uh, we, we just, we're doing this, we're going about this the wrong way to get the results that we want to achieve. Um, I should say uh, at this point, I guess, that uh, there, there have been two policies in the Department of Justice for people uh, doing outside speaking. The first one was you should always give a disclaimer and say, you know, these are my own views, not those of the Department of Justice. And then they changed that and they just said, decided, well, if you're going to speak outside, you should be uh, expressing the views of the Department of Justice. Uh, and so there's no need for a disclaimer. I feel the need for a disclaimer there. <laughs> I won't necessarily uh, articulate the views of the Department of Justice today, only because I'm not sure what they are in some cases. But in any event, uh, Judge Sorokin developed this uh, program, developed the RISE program, said he wanted uh, restorative justice to be part of it. I said, I'm interested in that. He put me in touch with some people. It have already been mentioned today, actually, the Transformational Prison Project, uh, who was working with the people at uh, MCI Norfolk Prison. Uh, who had developed their own restorative justice program. And so a couple of shout outs went out to Armand Coleman and Noble Williams. Um, there are a couple of people who actually taught me how to do this uh, because um, I, I experienced one restorative circle and it was a life altering event. And I said, you know, I need more of this. And they let me train to facilitate there. And so I did that in some prison, uh, in prisons. And then I got involved helping Maria uh, administer this program. So. That's why I'm here. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna go straight to uh, some of the challenges that we would face in implementing a restorative justice program in other districts. I'm just gonna go down the line and I'll just ask uh, each of the panelists uh, if, they, if they care to name one of those challenges and sort of flesh out a little bit um, uh, why it's challenging for us. You don't necessarily have to come up with the, uh, the, the solutions now if you don't want to, but uh, uh, Judge Sorokin. So uh, a huge challenge is, faci is facilitators who can do this well. So I, and the way this comes up, it comes up in two ways. In our district, we have, um, you seeing most of the facilitators, they have Maria, but I don't have, I can't, uh, despite my job, I can't get all of Maria's time to do this. So there's only, she has like two jobs. She has being a probation officer and doing all of this. And so eventually I got the time of Jamie because he was interested and, and another uh, federal prosecutor, but um, it takes time for people to be trained. And I, Jamie has cases too. He doesn't just do this. 
and the same for the other AUSA. So having, that's a huge limitation. You need facilitators. You need people who trained and can do it well. And I talk to other judges at, at conferences like this, but for judges, and many of them are interested in the problem I always have is then they say to me, well, okay, this is great, I wanna do this. Who's gonna do it? And then I don't have a name of someone in St. Louis or Chicago or New York or wherever uh, to do it. And that, so having, one, having people who are trained to do it well, and two, having money to pay them. Either because they're on, like Jamie, we don't pay Jamie to do this because he's already on the government payroll in a form. But then someone has to agree to give up that much of his time on the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Federal Defender Office. We have some people from there who are out of, I don't know how Jessica does it because she has a huge heart. And um, so, but there has to be some way or you need an independent pool of money. So that to me is one of the biggest challenges of scaling up and doing it and being sure that then it's done well. Devon, what do you, what do you see as uh, one of the challenges we're facing? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. So for us, when I say us, I mean the federal court. We, I'm pretty sure we're not allowed to apply for grants, and the probation office, which Maria works for, is an arm, is part of the court, so they can't apply for grants. Um, I suspect the Department of Justice does not apply for grants. So um, Tavon was actually, we were talking about this this morning, and Tavon was saying, well, what about all those drug courts? How did they expand and get funded? They all got funded by the, De not all, but a lot of them got funded by the Department of Justice. But all those grants went to state courts. And in fact, when you turn the dial back to say 2006 to 2009, when <coughs> drug courts began to appear in the federal system, there were, the Department of Justice was opposed. They were handing out tons of money to state drug courts. But Attorney General Ashcroft, one of the least read publications of the federal government, was a report on why drug courts shouldn't be happening in federal courts. And so um, uh, there's like, but there's no, they weren't funding internally, like giving grants or what have you. So that's the problem. Sure. Yeah, that's funny. We was just talking about that this morning. And I don't know if I'm going left field with my answer, but um, one of the challenges implementing the program in other districts, I think is, um, you know, the examples, like uh, other districts may need to polarize in examples that of, um, people like such as myself, JC, and many other people I know because it's, uh, you know, it's probably not as known. And um, like, it, I, I hear a lot of people say it's kind of soft, like it's a soft, it seems like a soft approach, but um, I look at it totally different. I look at it, if you want to be tough on crime prevention, then as opposed to tough on crime, then you, you know, you would be moving towards uh, restorative justice. I just had a, a conversation with a gentleman in the hallway you know, and um, I was telling them, like, you know, when I was in the streets, you know, I had a bunch of um, people that followed me, you know, maybe 50. And, you know, by, you know, pulling me out of that life and into this life, now there's, an ent there's 50 to times 10 people who I can now go back to and, and give this uh, restorative message to and change lives. So I think uh, as far as, um, you know, the challenges, I think the, the examples need to be more polarized. I think it needs to stop being looked at as a soft approach and understand that it's, it's really a tougher approach than just mass incarceration. I did a lot of time and it did really nothing for me. You know, I, I've been involved with restorative justice for uh, close to four, well, four years now and uh, it was, it's been life changing. Sitting in that circle by far. Um, I, I, I tell people all the time, you, you know, you can pretty much do 30 years in prison and still never accept responsibility for your crime because, you know, most of us go in, you know, and, you know, we go in and, like JC said, our thing is we just, we're going in and we're waiting for our end date. And in between that, we're just doing time. You know, um, a lot of time there's no reflection. We don't know how to reflect. We weren't taught how to reflect. Um, a lot of our crimes may be drug crimes or uh, what's called white collar crimes. So we feel as though there's no victim because 
you know, somebody didn't die or, you know, we didn't uh, catch an assault and battery or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, we don't understand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Listen, when I'm around <laughs> Jack Sorokin, I gotta watch my words, and uh, because it, you know words mean things, and his one of his biggest things with me is I caught a case, you know, and uh, that case didn't just fall out of the sky, and I and we caught it, you know. So, um, but um, yeah, you know, so it's like that meaningful acceptance of responsibility is tough. Like that's what changed my life. Looking at um, a woman in her eyes, and she called me a monster, you know, and in a circle. And, you know, those type of words, it, it, you know, it may seem like it's no big deal, but when you got to do a reflection of yourself and you've never seen yourself, you know, like that, you know, it's, um, you know, these type of things, you know, they really touch home. So facing, you know, uh, circles and victims and, you know, uh, continuing to work and talking to the youth and just wherever you go with it, it's, um, it's, it's a lot tougher than like, you know, going in, coming out doing the same thing, repeat, you know, so uh, I definitely think sitting in that circle is a lot tougher. Yeah, so if anyone didn't hear JC, the first part of his question was, you know, what do you think was harder, doing the time or, or sitting in that circle? Um, Tamal, let me stay with you for, for just a second. Um, so I think a lot of our traditional criminal legal system approach is based on uh, progressive punishment, obviously. Uh, JC's been part of it, I think you've been part of it. Um, you know, the idea is, uh, you know, you get caught the first time, we're going to punish you, um, you know, in, in some fashion. You get caught a second time, we're really going to have to make it hurt this time. Um, you get caught a third time, well, five years didn't do it last time, then you need ten years this time. Because at some point, if we keep, you know, hitting you harder and harder and harder, you're going to decide that it, this just isn't worth it anymore, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's why you're going to change your behavior. Talk about that approach, uh, you know, from from the inside. You know, is that is that resonating with anybody? Uh, did, did you did you ever feel that? Uh, did you ever did you see that? Was that prevalent around you? And JC, it's sort of the same thing. I would say that happens probably three percent of the time, you know, and which is pretty much none. Um, we, you know, you do get tired, but if you're not, uh, you get tired of going in and out after a certain age, but. You know, if you know nothing else, then, you know, it just is what it is. You go back to doing what you do. Um, so uh, the, the, the methods just, it's just not working. Again, like I said, we can do it. I, I did, the uh, longest time I did was 10 and a half years straight in the feds. And um, by the end of my sentence, I said, I want to go home. I want to do better. And um, that's what I attempted to do. Um, I went in as a 24-year-old man, came home at 35 years old, paid taxes for the first time in my life at 35 years old, um, you know, got a job and the whole nine, and it just didn't make sense. You know, um, it wasn't enough money. I had three children that were, ch that were children when I went in, now they were teenagers. I had a lot of people that looked up to me, and the resources weren't there, so, you know, um, it just it just started to cycle back over again and you know I'm back in to the same scenario so it's like when we go inside you know we got to create our own resources for ourselves the there's there's not uh, the rehabilitation side of things isn't isn't there so you know people like uh, me and JC like uh, part of this process you know when I was on this last time when JC talked about he got picked up uh, I got picked up with him we didn't know each other and um, I just, Jessica fell in my lap. I caught Jessica. <laughs> Judge Sorokin can't say anything did. about that. I agree with that. <laughs> and um, no, I mean, literally, like, she just was in the court and got assigned to me, and it was just by chance, I guess. Um, but, um, and JC told me, you know, because we were talking, you know, and amongst all the people that came in, you know, everybody, you know, a lot were young, and we were kind of tired on our, our edge, and, you know, and, uh, he was like, listen, man, you know, because we had conversations about not wanting to be a part of this life and this thing not being cool. And uh, he's like, listen, if you are who you say you are, then stay with your lawyer. Don't even look for another one because I'm looking for, you know, some high priced attorney to get out of this situation I'm in. And he said, listen, if you are who you are, just stay with Jessica, you know, and that's why I stayed with Jessica, you know, strictly because of that. But um. The, ma the back to the point, like the, you know, the mass incarceration is just, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. And um, it's, it's, uh, 
when we go in, like, you know, it, it's, emba it's embarrassing, you know, now to really think about how many, I, I got, I, I had a judge tell me I had something like 40, 40 arraignments or something. And the number was so crazy, I was, I mean, I was just like, wow, you know, I didn't know that. But um, it's just, it, 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 it was, nothing was ever taught to me by constantly thinking you're gonna punish me more through the prison system. It, it, um, it had, it took, um, like when we go and say, uh, I'm gonna, I hate the term in federal prison, and in, in, in the state, it's just plain and simple, we're copping a plea. And that's really what it is. We're running. We're copping the plea, taking the time, and getting out of here. But in the feds, this this nice term, you know, accepting responsibility, and it's BS. We're not accepting anything. We just understand that if I say this, I'm going to get less time. You, you're going to reduce me three levels. You're going to move me over here. This is going. It's no acceptance of responsibility. Like um, I didn't. I, I never accepted responsibility of my crime until. You know, I went to a circle, got beat up in a circle, learned a lot, and under now started to reflect and understood the harm that I was causing to my community and people. Um, uh, like actual individuals started coming up in my head. So um, if I, you know, stayed in, out, in, out, and I wasn't introduced to this life of restorative practices, it wouldn't be the same. And I would think JC would feel the same way as well. Uh, thanks, Devon. We're going to find out. JC, you want to add anything to that on the subject of progressive punishment? You're still on the spot. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to, but if you want to. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, as I looked at it, it was like your parents send you to a playground. The way I looked at jail, like I go to a playground and I play with the kids for the day, then I go home. But the next day, I want to go right back out there and do the same thing. And that's how being inside came to me. It was just like, there's so many people inside, nobody has time to deal with you one-on-one. -on -one. So the circle was so important to me because somebody made me look at myself through my actions, through what I did, my, you know, what I caused my community, the long-term, short-term, and dealing with um, you know, just the younger kids idolizing you coming up that that is not a good thing, to see a young kid idolize something that's so negative. And that's what made me realize that I gotta change. Even if I think I don't, I gotta because there's people looking at me. Now I have kids and I'm a parent and you know there's young kids out there doing things. I don't want my kid involved with that. But how do I spread that to my kid that can spread it to his friend, to lead in his household to others? So that's what made me feel like that circle is 10 times better than being in a prison because the prison, you just doing a regular, you find your schedule and you just do it until the day they tell you, hey, you're leaving home tomorrow and you're happy and you go home, but then it's back to if you're not changing, what are you doing? And it, the circle also told me, you know, you go, some of us is unfortunate that you have to go back to your same communities. And when you go back to that same community, the same people are there. Or you just left them in there. And I was telling Devon today, it's like, that circle gave me the, the love to say, I love this person, but I love them at a distance now. Mm -hmm. I don't love them close to hug them and everything. I love them at a distance because I'm on a different path and I can see if they're honest to, to get some help or get what I got that I can give them to make our community better, just living day to day. Yeah, thanks so much, JC. Um, Jessica, what do you see as uh, one of the challenges to expansion? So I think one of the biggest challenges is just resistance from all corners. So just whether it's resistance and it's resistance from prosecutors, it's resistance from defense attorneys, resistance from the bench. And the idea that, uh, I mean, we're so, the, the jobs that we do as system players is, are very exhausting. And just to be good at them technically, you have to work really, really hard. And to be good at your 
traditional role of being a good judge or being a good defense attorney or a good prosecutor. You just have to work really hard and many, many hours. So it's really hard to get people to think differently because they're just trying to do a good job at what they do. And it's important that we do a good job at what we do in many, many ways. We can't just, um, uh, we can't be lazy about that or we can't be not technically proficient, but it's, it's, um, so it's hard in that context to get people to think about a different uh, approach uh, and to educate people about um, what it means to both be technically proficient in the 3% of cases when you do need to go to trial or when you do need to behave in your traditional role and how to think about um, whether or not most of the time what we're doing is really advancing the things that we say that we care about, which is safe communities, um, uh, thriving people, protect ha uh, satisfied victims, um, low recidivism. Are we really collectively doing that and are there other ways to do that? So that resistance and educating people about different ways in the context in which we work day in and day out is, um, is difficult. Yeah. Thanks. Um, oh yeah, question, yeah. I think we would have to be so much bigger for either of those two groups to be worried about us. I think at this moment, uh, we're, we're, we're just so small compared to, that. we're not, those people are, to the, to the extent those people, if we were big, would we worry? They're not worried about us because they're just not, they're not even, I don't think so. The skepticism I think that Jessica's referring to is just, you know, I think there are, uh, there are not every prosecutor is Jamie. And, or SEMA, and so there are prosecutors who are like, why should we do this? And if we're gonna do this, we should only do this after prison, after everything, and why can't we do it then? And that fundamentally is a view, is the view that, well, if you do the crime, then you need to do the time, and we can look up in the sentencing guidelines mathematically how much time you should do for this crime, and nothing else, the sentencing guidelines don't really account for anything else. They produce a number based on that. And so if that, and then not, and you, know, you have defense attorneys, it's not mere coincidence that the two participants both happen to be represented by the same lawyer. Um, not every participant who's in our program has been represented by Jessica, but there are lawyers who honestly don't have a clue. Like they don't, like they, they're sitting there and they could do things for their client and they just don't understand how to do that. And there's not for lack of us having training programs for criminal defense, so it's not like we have 10,000 lawyers who do criminal cases in Boston. But not all the people are open to it or can figure it out or can connect the dots even when it's laid out reasonably well for them. And so you have that and then, you know, the, that, that, so you have all sorts of, and I, I think it's hard honestly for lawyers generally, it's maybe too much to go to, but I think lawyers find it challenging sometimes something new. And it require, this requires people to think differently and to think, to be open-minded and be willing to say, well, hey, maybe there's a different way to do this and I should at least figure it out and learn it. And one of the things I find that's resistance is a lot of people don't want to learn. And if they don't learn, you'll never overcome the skepticism that Jessica referred to. Or the culture that, would, or the culture the culture that, that Tavon was referring to. That's exactly. right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and I, I wanted to just mention one, I think, unique, somewhat unique thing about our particular program that I think is really powerful um, on that culture piece that does do a lot to overcome the skepticism for the people who are able to, to participate. And I think it's, for everyone who, who participates, it's very powerful, which is when we do a circle, um, everyone in that circle who participates except for the facilitator really, um, does everything that we do together. So th if there's an assignment in the, in, over the course of the two days, 
write a letter um, to someone that you harmed or write a letter to someone that harmed you. We all do it. So as a defense attorney, I do it. As a prosecutor, Jamie does it. Tavon, as a participant, does it. Or if he's now a facilitator, um, you know, help a community member, he's now doing it. So we're all doing that together. So there's something very, um, and then we all read it. So, so you know, in, if I'm the, the participant and Jamie is reading the story of a time where he's been victimized or when he victimized someone, it's a very different experience. It's, it's a very different process. And I think so much of the system, even when we're trying to do good things and trying to help people, we just hit, we, it's like the program mentality. Like, here's another program to do. Here's a program for you because you're the problem. We're trying to fix you. And in our process, it's not, it doesn't feel like another program. It feels like we're all sitting across from each other, making ourselves differently vulnerable um, together. And so there's something about that that, that really opens people in a different way to their attitudes about the system, their attitudes about each other, their attitudes about their roles, and um, that can be incredibly powerful. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Jessica, I was wondering, um, do you, uh, you can repeat it, but do you, uh, do you advise all of your clients to do this program, or do you kind of assess yourself who would be well suited for it? And then what does that look like? Who do you think it's maybe not good for? So I, I don't advise all of my clients to do it, but I will say, because I, I've, you know, I think a lot about what restorative practices mean, I do use a restorative mentality in every one of my cases. So some of my clients just aren't ready to do it, and I, and you know, I've been doing it long enough that I, I can recognize someone who's ready. And when someone, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong sometimes. I maybe I don't recognize, but I try very hard to recognize someone who, and it has nothing to do with what their criminal record looks like, right? So, so with Tavon, with JC, I mean, there, no way. I mean, I, I when I, when I met both of them. I recognized someone who, was, who felt very ready, but there was no way I was ever going to, in my mind, with their records, sorry, guys, like I was ever going to be able to get them out in the first place to be able to do this. So I had to sort of act like a lunatic to get them both out, like keep going back to the magistrate judge for some new reason, some changed circumstance. Like I had to be kind of crazy. Because it, like Tavon was saying, I knew there were 50 people and another 500 people, and, and, a, and I knew there were his children, and his, like it just had to happen. So, um, and same with the same with JC. And then, so it has nothing to do with that, what's on paper, it ha just has to do with developing that relationship with them, with the people that I represent and their families and understanding. And, but, so in those cases, I just work really hard to try to make it happen. But in every case, um, uh, I try to think through with my client um, what meaningful acceptance of responsibility looks like. And I try to think through what um, there's in you know, some of the restorative justice literature, they talk about that, that you talked about the difference between guilt and shame. There's this language of reintegrative shaming and disintegrative shaming. So I, I try to think about, huh, you know, I try to, you know, sort of talk with my clients about um, the impact of their harms. And, um, and, and then, you know, sometimes it's a very traditional adversarial role where, you know, my client just didn't do it. And so we're <laughs> having a different kind of con conversation there. But, um, but I, I do try to think restoratively in all of my cases. And I also try to think restoratively in the way that I approach, thinking about that culture issue, the way I approach pr prosecutors. Like, I try not to be an asshole, <laughs> number one, right? Um, I try, when they call my clients incorrigible, I try to, talk to them about examples of people with really long records who are, um, who we may have called incorrigible at some point, who are doing amazing work in the community. I, you know, so it, so I just try to be restorative as a defense attorney, which is not, was not my training, really. <laughs>
question about the nuts and bolts of how you get somebody confident to do this job well. I, I think, think that's you might have you a potential or army of helpers out there to really want big I things. think Maria probably yeah, or, Mar could Mar answer Mar that. Mar Maria and Sema. <laughs> The, be, the only comment I'd make is my, my only worry with law students being facilitators is they're young, and I think that a certain amount of the sort of emotional understanding and life experience sometimes would be helpful. But in terms of what it takes, I'd turn to Maria. Um, it's a little bit of a hard question, and I defer back to what Seema said, right? And so there's not one, like, four-day training or one... Um, class that you can take and sort of be ready to take on the world and be the best facilitator ever. And so our experience is that we um, really let each person sort of lead the way and we do a lot of shadowing and sitting in circle. We encourage folks to sit in in a variety of different restorative justice trainings and seminars and talks um, both from sort of IARP and local organizations. IARP is the International Institute of Restorative Practices. Yeah. Um, and local organizations and grassroots organizations. And we encourage folks to sit in circle and actually do the work and observe and participate and be part of it as much as possible. And then folks sort of shadow us as we go through the process. And we really let them lead the way when they're ready to take on it and sit in as a facilitator. Um, just as an example, like Jamie's a superstar. He was ready really quickly. Someone else, an, um, another one of our wonderful facilitators, I think it was about a year and a half before she took on her role. Um, and so it really depends on the person and their level of, I don't want to say skill, but just. Some um, of it maybe, I don't know, but one question I had is whether how much time they also have to devote to it, so we're like you're positing people in a clinic potentially who are full time doing it, whereas these the people we're talking about are all lawyers with other roles, and so they have to find three days to go to the IARP conference, and then they have to find this. Our circle is two days, so they have to go. Like we don't have that many of them, and when they have them, they have to be sure it's not when they're on trial or something else, so they can go those two days. So that also can stretch out the the time period. It is something we've sort of discussed a little bit about the idea of a clinic, um, but you have the problem of both funding the clinic and turnover. I'll pass it over. I think you've got it. Yeah. There's one thing Jessica said about the circle that I didn't answer the question about sort of why, what brought me to this, but one of the things that convinced me that restorative justice is a good idea. I came to it, I heard someone speak about some restorative justice programs in 2007, thanks actually to the Sentencing Commission at a conference they sponsored um, about alternatives. And I wanted to learn, it was enough to pique my interest, and I went, I wanted to learn more, and there was a group in Boston called ROCA that runs restorative justice programming for um, young people between 16 and 15 and 24. And I asked them if they would tell, meet with me and explain it to me, and they said no. They said, um, <laughs> They said, no, we won't explain to you. All you can do is come to a circle. And they said it would be 16 hours. I'm like, come on. It's just like, I don't have 16 hours. And eventually, I caved, and I went, because they were very unreasonable, and they wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't explain it to me. And I was, they were right. And I was, I was, but one of the things that struck me was in the circle, it was, there were, it was a big circle. There were probably 25 or 30 people. And it was kind of like an introductory circle to restorative practices. And everybody was just a person. So there, were, there was a guy from the sheriff's department in Western Mass who wanted to learn about it because they run the prison out there and they were interested. And, and there were these kids, kid, to me kids, they were like 16, 20, 22. And they, some of them, I don't know why they were there. I assume they were there because they might have had juvenile cases or adult cases or they'd be, they were just there because they thought that, because Roca had programming for people who weren't involved in the criminal system. And it was just, everybody was sat at the same level Right? Not like this, and certainly not like the courtroom. And everybody was just a person on a first name. And I was really struck by that, and it seemed like a really powerful thing. And that's what really, to me, struck me. is like, that's exactly the opposite of what we do in the courtroom. And, um, and it, I found it like it would be, like it was connecting. I felt connected to some of these other people. And it would be, it just seemed empowering and a very different thing. That's what really motivated me. Courtney. Yeah. Right. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, Jamie, whether or not you see the kind of cultural change within the office that Seema talked about. Um, 
I mean, I feel like one of the things that I feel like was sort of revelatory about the RJ programming in the DC Attorney General's office is that it was a concrete program that allowed the, the AAGs to sort of start to see their role differently. Um, and maybe you're gonna talk about this, so I apologize if we're jumping no, the gun, but no, that's a great my, story. yeah, mm. like my experience when I was a federal prosecutor was not that folks became, like my experience was not that they became you, my experience was that the longer they were in the office, the more they felt like, well, if you had one chance and two chances and now it's your third chance, then you absolutely deserve to be in the federal system and you absolutely deserve to get teed up. And so one of the things that I was wondering is, has the program in the District of Massachusetts sort of enabled prosecutors to question their role or see their role differently? Or is that something that you think is still a barrier? And if so, like, what is it about the federal system that might be uniquely, I don't know, difficult? That's a great question. So it's, it's <coughs> A resounding yes for anyone who's experienced restorative justice, um, and and I am not unique in, in in my enthusiasm for restorative justice as a prosecutor. We've had a number of them from my office who have participated in in various to various degrees in restorative justice, whether in the at Norfolk prison or in our program, and they have all been uh, changed as a result of it. Um, and these are again like me; these were pretty uh, typical traditional prosecutors. These are not people who came in with a reformer's mindset. Um, Seasoned, probably. A, lot, a number of them very, were, very were like with years right. of experience. Some of them were very tough. Right. And so, I mean, that, that's the one thing I, I just cannot overstate uh, to this group. If you have not experienced restorative justice and you, and, and you have found what you've heard today compelling, I can tell you that it does not hold a candle to the actual experience. Um, and I, I hate to say it, we spent an afternoon talking about this, but you really can't, you can't really communicate the power of restorative justice through uh, words. I mean, you can get somebody really interested in experiencing it and then maybe frustrated because it's hard to find an opportunity to sit in a, in a circle. But when you experience this, it is such an aha moment immediately. Um, and we had um, a, a, our fairly recent first assistant U.S. attorney who came in, I think uh, supportive of restorative justice based on what he had heard. He came in and sat in on one session of one of our restorative justice reading groups at uh, Wyatt Detention Center, and he was a complete convert. Um, and he just said, this is unlike anything I imagined. And it was one two-hour session with, I think, four guys uh, who were detained at that point. And we went deep in that two hours. And that's, that's the thing that happens in these circles is you end up going to a much deeper level than any of us are used to um, in our regular you know, daily interactions, even with close friends and families. And I don't want that to sound sort of you know, mystical or, or spooky or anything, but it, it, it just, you get to a deeper level of honesty and interaction, you know, as, um, Maybe they'll bleep this out, but one of the people in uh, the women's prison I did this in, just put it simply, shit gets real um, in, in these circles. And it does. It really does. Um, so for anybody who's experienced it, absolutely. It's, it's life-altering, I, I think. Um, for those who have not experienced it, yes, there's, um, there's varying degrees of reaction to it. I think people in my office are generally getting the impression that um, this seems to be doing some real good for people. And they're accepting of that, and there's, there's real frustration around some issues w which we can talk about, um, but I think there's sort of a growing acceptance. And then there's a lot of people who are resistant to it. Um, I, you know, I think for reasons that you would imagine, and, and man, maybe, maybe some others that wouldn't be as, as apparent, um, clearly there is, there is a, a feeling, there, there's people in my office who think I'm working for the uh, federal public defender right now. Um, they, they think that this restorative justice is just another way for people to get a lower sentence and that's not our job. You know, they've got a defense lawyer to do that. Um, they certainly don't need to be using court resources, much less U.S. Attorney's Office resources to help them get a lower sentence. Um, uh, they, there's a lot of frustration around the way we do this, which is, that's one of the reasons I asked Seema the question about whether there's any qualitative assessment based on, uh, on how the uh, participant did in it. Uh, we, in, very intentionally, do not. And this is uh, something that Maria has felt strongly about from the beginning. And there have been times where we have had some real 
debates over whether that's a policy we should stick with. But every time you know, I try to debate Maria, <laughs> I come away convinced that Maria's right, um, that uh, if we don't stick with this policy of not giving any qualitative assessment, we can't expect real authenticity from people. So if we're going to grade them, uh, we're going to lose some of that authenticity. And the equality. And the other, and the other major issue is you know, some people are naturally going to come to this. Uh, you know, Tavon might come into this program and take to it readily, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and be very demonstrative about his acceptance of it. You know, JC might come into it and, and be quieter about it and um, not say as much uh, during the circle. And yet, you know, look at the two of them and look at the impact that they are both having at this point. And, you know, if, if we have a, if we run a workshop or go through the entire program and Tavon's prosecutor says, you know, how did he do? And I say, man, he was amazing. You know, I can't, I can't restrain myself from talking about how, you know, dynamic he was in this workshop. And they go, oh, yeah, how did JC do? Hey, he's good too, you know? Because <laughs> um, I just didn't see as much and I didn't know what was going through his head on that. And we don't feel like that's fair to JC. Um, so we, we intentionally do not give qualitative assessments and we say to people, if this has affected you, then it's on you and your attorney to communicate that to the court at sentencing. And, and, uh, and so, but, but a corollary to that is, um, you know, there's, there's three people in the courtroom at sentencing before the, before the bench and two of them, the defendant and the defense lawyer, know what went on in those restorative, you know, the workshop and the restorative conferences. And the one person who has no visibility in the process is the prosecutor. And, and, they're, and they're left frustrated. They're saying, you know, I'm, how can I do my job if I have no visibility into this important factor that I know is going to result in a lower sentence here? I've got nothing to say. And so, you know, that's, that's a frustrating so, thing. But there's, there's one organization that is doing this a little bit on the outside on a contract basis, and they're writing a letter to the court, and it's always glowing, and, and you know, we've even said to them, you know, uh, well, what if, it, what if your reaction isn't as glowing? And they said, well, trust me, it'll always be glowing. All right, well, that's great, and I respect, the, I respect where they're coming from, and yet at the same time, I really am afraid that that's going to water down the whole process. It's going to become like... Um, you know, the battle of the experts when there's a, a psych issue in a case or something like that. You know, defense lawyers can always find a, a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist to say this person is impaired in some fashion. The government can always find someone to say the opposite, and they're both going to get discounted. So we're looking for, you know, we, we continue to, you know, hammer this point of radical authenticity. I don't, we'll get that one question. There's one more thing yeah. I want to say about that. I don't want to know what happened in the circle. As a sentencing judge, I don't care what happened in the circle, and I don't want to know, because what I want to see is post after the circle, what are the words and deeds of the person? The reason JC and Tavon are here are not because of what, I don't know what they said in the circle. This is the first time actually I've ever heard anything about what happened when they were in the circle, except for one minor little tidbit that Tavon and I talked about once. But. Um, but the reason they're here is because of what they did afterwards. And it's, the cha it's what they've said and done later. And that's what I tell my colleagues about it, that that's what matters. You don't need to, no one's really asked, my colleagues don't seem, they're not pressing me about what happened in the circle. But I'm like, that doesn't matter. Like what ma it doesn't matter if the person sits there silently or if they like, always have their hand raised, so to speak, and getting an A. It like, matters what happens afterwards. And so um, the report, that's why, that's another reason like, I don't, well, I think it's fine not to get a report. And where that leads to from a practical level is why this is potentially more appealing to someone. One of the issues is if you're out, if you're released, you could do this and then you have an opportunity, a period of time to, be, to do things where your words and deeds can show up at sentencing. And that seems fair and that's something the prosecutor can respond to. They can uh, say they didn't do that or they did it or they didn't do other things or whatever, but it's just facts that they can engage with. And for people who are in custody, which is something we're doing, that's a newer thing we're doing, it's harder because they're in, like, they're in custody. What are they gonna do? Not get a disciplinary report. Okay, fine, but that doesn't, like, what does that tell you? And so they don't have a lot of opportunity and one of the things that all this leads to potentially I'm just saying we haven't, I haven't proposed this, so this is just like a possibility, but is it leads to people either getting out, people who are detained, then getting released. 
And then, because they've changed, and so the facts have changed, and they're now someone who wouldn't have gotten released before, but now they could get released. And then, in terms of like this whole process, then they have an op then there's an opportunity to they're, they're out and released. There's an opportunity to demonstrate whatever change there is. And um, and the the other part of that, and this is an issue like sometimes it comes up, and it's a it's not it's not purely like a skepticism issue, but like should the sentencing be delayed? In other words, should the sentencing be delayed to allow someone to do this process, or if or should it be delayed if they've done the process? Should it be delayed to have them more time to to show good conduct? And how long? One month, one year, like and. Um, so that's a, an issue of which there's been um, in, in disagreements, particularly for the people in custody. I want to come back to uh, Tavon, actually, for just a second. Um, on, well, and, yeah, on oh, our, you had a, sorry. a question yeah, back yeah, then. Sorry. About. Yep. Actually, this is a question for you, Jennifer. Um, so when you as the adult person approach you have the ability to make a You mean about whether, when there's a dispute about whether to participate in restorative justice? Or even to make a recommendation before the two parties start to do battle. Like, you know, it's more of a matter of just... So I guess there's a couple layered answer to that. The first is in the federal system. The federal rules prohibit me from participating in plea bargaining. So I wouldn't say, I think it would be, it'd probably be, a, I haven't thought through completely, but I think it would probably be a violation of the rules for me at an early stage in a criminal case to just say, you might want to think about doing restorative justice. I mean, it's not exactly, you could do restorative justice and go to trial in theory, but it's kind of cognitive dissonance. Um, so I think I'm probably not, I think that's probably not appropriate for me to do. Um, it, you know, at sentence, I have brought it up, uh, the case I referred to earlier, um, I brought it up at a sentencing well, I didn't. I think I was talking to, maybe it was at the break, I was talking about it with oh, one person. But I had a, I've had a, at least one case at sentencing where at the sentencing I thought this is a case that's appropriate, someone participated in restorative justice. And I said, you should think about it. And I said, I'm not sentencing today. Give you a chance to think about it. You can all do whatever you want. And take whatever positions you want and then I'll see. But you come back in two weeks or so after you've had a chance to think about it, you either tell me you do or don't want to do it, defend it, and in government you can say you do or don't oppose. So that, yes. And sort of, should I continue it or not? Sure, I can decide that. But okay. So um, let me just give you, Tavon, a chance to answer one question. We'll come back to these two questions here because this is, this relates to sort of challenges, not necessarily to doing restorative justice, but to doing the way we do it, which which includes involvement of uh, prosecutors. And there's two uh, disparate areas of challenge that you can get from that. That restorative justice purists would say. Uh, no government actor should have their mitts on this program at all. The government will corrupt anything that it touches and will bend it to its traditional way of doing justice and it will become just uh, you know, a fig leaf uh, to, to make them uh, feel like the system is so more restorative. So purists would just say what we are doing is not restorative justice and is wrong. Yeah, and then, and then there's other, other people who, would, you know, who are not restorative justice purists who would just say prosecutors shouldn't be involved, it's not your job. So Tavon, um, let me just get your take on that. Uh, prosecutors in the process, good, bad, or indifferent? Well, <laughs> Jamie changed my life. I um, didn't ask the question for that reason. <laughs> I mean, just in general, <laughs> positionally. Uh, no, like, um, it, if you ask, where I grew up, we hate prosecutors, we hate judges, we hate probation officers, we hate police officers because every time we encounter them, it's bad. We even hate a lot of defense attorneys because we feel like they're selling us out. So the system on a whole is like our enemy in these, you know, in the scenarios we grow up in, and prosecutors are the worst. So, um, you know, in being involved in, in, you know, a circle and uh, being involved in restorative practices the first time this ever happened with a prosecutor was with, with Jamie, and um, even an attorney I was talking to at the time, <clears throat> rest in peace, she was a good friend. And, you know, I was mentioning, you know, about Jamie and a circle and all this, sh and even she frowned, like, what? Like, <laughs> she just couldn't comprehend it, like, no. 
you know, and I'm like, well, he's different. You know, I wish I could let you <laughs> hear him, but you know, confidential. And um, but I think that that's like extremely important. And um, I don't know, you know, if everybody knows the process, but um, like a lot of, you know, at the end of a at the end of a circle, you know, we're asked, you know, if we want such and such to come or you know, we vote on it, you know, uh, like if Judge Sorokin comes in the end or, you know, uh, in my circles, you know, defense attorneys came in the end and Judge Sorokin came. Uh, I don't think anybody's gonna say no at the end, <clears throat> at the end anyway, but, um, you know, with understanding that, that um, other side to hear, like I heard a letter Jamie wrote and um, it just, it, it kind of blew my mind because I, you know, I met Jamie like this, so I couldn't comprehend like him being that other prosecutor that it's just like, um, it's hard to imagine that. So he's actually gave me a gateway to even, you know, be able to communicate. I actually ran, run into my trial prosecutor a few times and we literally, I, like I sat on the stand right here and talked about his wife from the stand at a trial. I knew I was gonna lose, so I didn't care. And uh, he asked me why they, you know, called me a nickname, and I said, "Ask your wife." So, you know, it was like we hated each other. But I ran into him, and you know, he, he you know, he actually, you know, jabbed at me because we were speaking, and I was, he was, he said, "I heard a lot about what you're doing," and um, we had a great conversation. And I was only able to have that conversation because of the restorative justice, you know, um, process. And um, I would have never been able to have that conversation. So, you know. Um, prosecutors, police officers, you know, involved in, you know, the um, process is major, um, you know, because there's so many things that go, that, that it entails, like, I get phone calls from time to time from, you know, police officers I went to school with or whatever, hey, listen, something, you know, I, I might need your word, can you come by, you know, the school, can you come by here, talk to this kid, talk to that kid. You know, uh, I think you may know people over here and people over there, and maybe you can squash something. And I've done that for the past three or four years, you know, and that type of, those type of relationships wouldn't have been able to happen if I didn't see how we can all work together. Like me and Jamie even called each other colleagues today. And, you know, um, you know, I, I got such a high level of uh, respect for all of the people in here that, you know, these trained me, gave me opportunities, you know, give me phone calls. Judge Sorokin, you know, tells me, you know, me and Jessica, go ahead, go teach my class, if you like. You're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's just, it's been, it's been great. And, I, you know, I just think that without, I think without prosecutors or without, you know, both sides, I don't think it would work the same. Um, it, uh, it, because some of the process made me like, I, I always say like, I was probably about 85% done with crime before I got introduced to a circle. I, I was to the point where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm never gonna do that again. But then being introduced to the circle at the time that I was made me 100% sure, you know, it, it, because I understood like I could pick up my ball and walk away from crime and then I did the right thing. But I started to understand that I can't do that because, you know, I impacted my community so much and so many people it got to the point where it's like, okay, I gotta give back now. I can't walk away because I left you, you know, in in a certain way. So many kids, uh, or not even kids, 30 years old now, you know, come up to me and like, hey, I did this, you know, represented you while you were gone. And it's like, whoa, you know, when I start to see it, it's like, no. So, you know, um, just being in the circles and hearing the impacts and, and like, you know, Every view, it's just like, that's the reason why I couldn't just walk away. I feel like if I walk away, that's doing an injustice. So I'll never walk away. You know, I'm always gonna be available. I'm always on a phone call. Uh, Jamie actually gave me a call. He was doing a class, said, hey, listen, we're doing a reading. Can you, can you get on the Zoom with me? And I mean, it's always yes, <laughs> if I get a call from any of these guys. Um, yeah, and I, and I appreciate that, and I can tell you from my standpoint, it's, uh, if you haven't gotten this already, it's completely changed my perspective, not just on the criminal legal system, uh, but on life in general. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, we, we had two back here. Let me do uh, them and then you, uh, see. Hey, back on the last question, and Javon's comment there, I was wondering, uh, I'm in a, in a civil world, and they always are circling around the jurisdictions, they make you do a, Yes. 
Yes. And in these mediations, everything is off the records, nothing's inadmissible. Being that there seems like overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive effect of this program, would there be like a modified program that's mandated where somebody from the uh, prosecutor's so office that has a circle? It, it seems like it would generate societal benefit. Let's go to Jessica on this one, who's, who's yeah. uh, done civil and criminal work and uh, has, I think, done mediations and uh, interesting. Um, so, well, there are a couple parts of that um, question. I, I, I'm not in the restorative justice context. I'm, I, you know, I think it's, could, it's complicated and perhaps dangerous to, to do a court order to anything, I think. Um, I think the it would be great if the opportunity were offered to everyone. And so, but but from a, I, I don't, for, from my perspective, I don't think restorative justice should be coercive ever, certainly from a victim's perspective or from a, a defense perspective. I don't think it can work in that way. But I think that the opportunity should be offered and not just offered in a, in a sort of, um, routine kind of way, but in a meaningful way. One of the things that we struggle with is that, that we're, we're trying to work out really right now is, is sort of what is the, how do we advise victims that this is happening? How does the uh, prosecutor's office advise victims who should be doing that? How should we, um, what is the, op are they being given a meaningful option? Are they being educated about it? Um, are the defense attorneys doing a good job educating their clients about the opportunity? So I, I think um, it should be it should be an opportunity that's given to everyone in a in an, an educated opportunity. Um, yeah. Judge Rogan. I just think you can do it in civil cases, but I agree with Jessica. It shouldn't be mandated. Yeah. And I I bring it up in some civil cases, and I think there are cases where people. Uh, the example I think it was a case where they were going to do it. It was an employment discrimination uh, dispute where the two, the employee and the defendant manager, both were going to work together. They both worked for the government. They were going to be there together the rest of their lives, like whatever happened in the case. And they reached a settlement, and they did. They were going to do a restorative justice process part of it. I could see that they're in relationship, so I, I think it can work in civil cases. But I don't think it can mandate it in civil or criminal cases. Okay. Do we have another question? There? Yeah, kind of going on here. Okay, two, uh, two great questions. Uh, I, I will answer one of them at least uh, briefly because I, I think it ties back to our, yeah, the question about facilitation. I have a feeling that you could come away from this presentation today placing too much importance on the, the training or skills of the facilitator in terms of making this work. Um, I mean, when I showed up, I think the, for the first time as sort of a, a trainee in this, I, I expressed some concern. I don't know anything about this. I haven't had any training, and, and here I'm going into a circle. And the, the good advice I got was, all you need to do is show up as authentically as you possibly can, um, and listen, and treat everyone with respect uh, as a human being. So I think. The reason Taban can uh, just go out and sort of do ad hoc restorative justice work without, you know, a master's degree in restorative justice or you know several courses with IIRP, is because of the attitude that he brings uh, to the work that he's done. I really think attitude is is much more important than uh, anything else. So for a law student, um, no, I mean I, I I would not hesitate to have a law student. You know, participate in a circle to, um, you know, learn how to facilitate a circle. I, I think it's I think it's critically Im important. Um, any of you want to talk about sort of how you how you talk to the skeptic, which was an important part of our panel? Mm -hmm. We haven't. Sure, go ahead. No, well, I I, I want to say that I I think um, there is a huge need for law students and um, for people. And there are some dicey issues, right? From from a defense attorney's perspective, there are issues of confidentiality. There are issues of sort of how do we step out of the traditional role. There is so, and I love the idea of a clinic. Um, uh, I think it's an it's I've thought about it and thought about 
doing it, frankly, um, and, and not just in the restorative justice context, but in you know in other contexts, we have defense attorneys doing. Um, drug courts and things like that. There are a lot of really innovative, there's a lot of important innovative work that's being done out there that we need to have prosecutors and defense attorneys doing that work and we don't all have the, uh, and we're still all kind of trying to figure it out, the vocabulary. So um, I think it's really, um, I'm excited about the interest and um, I, I, I think it's important. So I want to validate that. I. I, I think in talk, talking to skeptics, um, I, I like to, number one, in ter terms of how you think about when a crime occurs, s sort of changing the way you think about it, like thinking about the harm, right? And what can be done to repair the harm. That's just a very basic, um, and that when a crime occurs, there's a sort of, uh, there's a, imbalance in society that needs to be corrected and how can we do that? And then for the skeptics, I just like to talk about public safety because it's really quite simple. If we care about communities and we care about safety, um, uh, there, there's nothing about, you know, Tavon getting the sentence that the prosecutor was originally asking for that would advance that if you're listening to what he's saying. But there's so much about what he's done because he didn't get, ultimately get that sentence that does advance that. And, and so that, that's just sort of one story, but the, the stats that we heard from SEMA, they, they support that idea. So if we care about public safety, then we need to do what we're doing differently. And I want to add to that <clears throat> something that is so easy to forget when we're talking about a program here that seems to be focused on uh, the, the participants uh, who've been charged with a, with a crime. I would think the most compelling thing for anybody who's listed today, uh, the most compelling response to a skeptic is, I've got uh, some people named uh, Clarissa and Chardonnay Turner that I would like you to speak with directly. Um, because the fact of the matter is, even if this did nothing uh, to reduce recidivism or incarceration, but it did do something to promote healing for people who've gone through this kind of uh, unimaginable pain, would this not be worth it? And so, I mean, I think if we're going, if we're going to say restorative justice is a victim-centered approach, then let's keep reminding ourselves that it really is a victim-centered approach. And the first two questions we should be asking is, who's been harmed and what do they need? Um, and, you know, only sort of secondarily would, but very importantly, but will we ask, all right, who has caused harm and what do they need? Because that's, that's important too. Um, but, you know, of course, that's a, it's a bogus hypothetical because the reality is they work together. Um, the process of, um, you know, Tavon, JC, myself, um, you know, accepting responsibility for the harm that we've caused promotes healing for the people that we've, that, uh, we've harmed. So. I think that I totally agree with that. And I, that is what I tell many people. I give them an example of a, something that one uh, mom told me a circle and to me that that it helped her and her family heal that's enough like that's that's that that's the end to my view it ends the discussions where the whole thing is worth it for that if that's all we're doing we're doing way more but I think that the second thing you could ask yourself or you could tell people I say this sometimes to people is like if you said to Google we're gonna outsource the entire criminal justice system and we'll pay you the government will pay you to do it the first question Google would ask would be okay what's the metric Right? How are we going to get paid? That's what they're going to want to know. And if you said to them, well, you're going to get paid based on arrests, convictions, and jail sentences, they'd say, oh, okay, well, we'll build a system pretty similar to what you had. They would tweak it. They would, they would be better at arrests, convictions, and, and getting sentences because the whole system would be oriented to that to maximize the payments. But, that's the, but the system would look reasonably similar to what we had. If you said to them, we want, well, what we're going to pay you is based on like shootings, overdoses, like how many, like, like maximum profit is zero shootings, zero overdoses, zero opioid deaths, like, and you, you gave them public safety measures like that, okay, which have huge collateral effects in people's neighborhoods, right, well beyond individual cases that we're all focused on. They'd say, oh, okay, we don't want your system. You, this is what you're paying us for. We're going to build something different. We're going to have police, and we're going to arrest people in charge. They're not going to eliminate cases, and they probably wouldn't eliminate prisons. But they'd have a vastly different system. And that's because it would be oriented to a vastly different goal. And the question is, 
do you, you know, like you can put it to people, are you interested in, like, is it, are you about getting convictions or are you about public safety? And it's not to say that there should never be a conviction. I'm not saying that at all, but like you're, what your focus is. So I think when you start thinking that way, it does make you think that's an answer to a lot of the skeptics don't like to confront those facts.